Welcome to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. Uh, one of Newton's laws of motion, as we're taught in grade school science class, goes something like, uh, to every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Now, this would also apply in Newton's laws of motion pictures, if such a thing uh, existed, because for every hero, there has to be a villain. And the greatest villain in not just Batman's universe, but maybe even our universe here in the sadly Batman free existence of the quote unquote real world. Inarguably, it's the Harlequin of hate, man. The clown prince of crime. I'm talking about the Joker. Dude, so badass, he's got one name like Moses or Cher. A uh, few performers have been bold enough to take the killer clown from the panels on the page to. Moving images on the big and little screens. Uh, Cesar Romero, of course, comes to mind. Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger. Amazing performances across the boards that chewed the fuck out of some very expensive backlot scenery. But when I think of the Joker, when I have to imagine his voice while reading a Batman comic or writing a Batman comic, like I wrote the Joker in Cacophony and in The Widening Gyre for DC Comics, when I have to imagine the Joker's voice, there's only one actor's voice I ever hear ringing in my head, man. Those other guys were great. The names I mentioned, uh, no doubt, each one of them worthy of a giant mallet or a lethal joy buzzer. You know, the, one of the highest honors you can give a Joker performance. But tonight's guest, ladies and gentlemen, he's not great. He's sublime. He gives the Joker venom of Joker performances. Once it gets in you, you cannot stop the giant smile that takes over your face. He is the people's joker. Some people are lucky uh, in this life to embrace one iconic role that people go like, man, they'll remember you for hundreds of years from now. This guy got two bites at the apple. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the voice, the voice of the joker, the only voice of the joker, Mr. Mark Hamill. Give it up. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, I never thought of it that way. And by the way, here's a little bit of trivia. The very first vo Joker voice in animation, who? you'll never guess. All right, let me take a shot in the dark. Take a shot. Is it Filmation or even before that? It would have been like 68, yeah, 60. I don't know if it's Filmation, but you're right in the right ballpark. It's one of the uh, more reviled versions of the character before they could really do it the way it was meant to be. And it, is it the one that I, is the, rah, 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 no. Yeah, I, but well, it was so funny. I never, well, I was doing research because I did the introduction of the Joker coffee table book. And I said, no, really? Because he's also an iconic actor mm -hmm. from a, a very famous uh, 1960s sitcom. He oh, was, all right, let me take a shot in the dark. Shot in the fucking dark yeah. on this one. The guy who played Mr. French in Family Affair. Oh, no, that's Sebastian Cabot. <laughs> that was a random shot. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. He's English. No, as a matter of fact, it was the who played uh, uh, Colonel Agarn from F Troop, Larry Storch. Get out of here. Yeah. That's, now, I, I have a fit. Yes. I, yeah. th so that is, I believe, the filmation joke. And I the think one it's like, well, brat, man. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's almost uh, part penguin, part joke. Yeah, it is. It's very interesting. But that was in the old school days when you know i think almost all the villains saying i will have you for my very own if you don't let me you know it was all the that performance was all at 11 yes yes it, and that's one thing i really wanted to do with joker is not make him so one way i was somewhat restricted by the fact that it was a children's show and standards and practices breathing down your neck all the time right. i'd get letters saying why don't you kill more people and you'd have to write <laughs> back and say you know it's a children's cartoon on the tv series he was more uh, all bark and no bite because we really couldn't now he did that thing where he would make people freeze into that death rictus yes. which is creepy as hell it's almost like a living death and they, it, it's a good uh villain ploy in a cartoon yes because there's no end to it necessarily like if you shoot somebody in a cartoon that's a real world device 
if somebody has a rictus grin spreading across their face that's somehow yeah. incapacitating them. And they're still alive. They're alive. Ugh. It works. Like the sensors yeah. will be like, yeah. that passes because it's for, unreal. Forget about the acid squirting uh, boutonniere. No way. Uh, they had to do really clever ways to get around violence. If you saw Robin's Reckoning, that two-part that told Robin's origin, when the, uh, uh, the Graysons died, you see the shadows of them on the a spotlight and the shadows fall away and they cut to the, the trapeze to hanging broken and then the horrified crowd reaction. You never actually see them plummet to their death. But in a way, having to get around standards and practices, it's much more creative and who arguably has much greater impact because it's suggested and you can put it in your own, you know, it's radio. It's you, it's drama for the mind and you create it for yourself. But it's funny because uh, Batman came into my life at a very young age. What point? Like that's where that's what we like to do: take you back to the origin and figure out right how you got to the Joker. Now, what I know of you, and and of course, there's things that we all know about you. But what I know of you, early career, is kid growing up where you're born one place, grew up someplace else. You're an army kid, or my, I'm kid? a Navy brat. I went to nine different schools. In 12 grades. Is that why acting? Is that why you lent toward Well, acting? I don't know. You do become very schizophrenic because you're always trying to fit in. And because you're going from coast to coast, you're going from San Diego to Brooklyn to San Jose to Pittsburgh. And they're so diverse that you have an East Coast wardrobe and then a West Coast. I mean, wingtips and... How many, so how many different marks do you think you had to develop over the course of your life? Well, it's interesting because first grade... Second grade, third grade. Those are three different places and three different schools. Then I went to San Diego and I did fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh because I was there four years, my longest stretch. But in those four years, I went to three different schools. I went to one junior high, then we moved. So, I mean, one grade school in fourth grade. Then we moved and I went to fifth and sixth at another grade school. And then I went to a third school for seventh grade and then we got transferred again. I'm the middle of seven children. I'm the only real comic book geek. My oldest brother is a doctor. He was six foot two, handsome, scholarships. You know, he's the success of the family because <laughs> science trumps the arts, let's face it. <laughs> uh, but I could never live up to him. And in a way, it removed a, a burden because I, I was so far out of the running in terms of he, you know, his uh, accomplishments. It was boy, girl, girl, me, girl, girl, boy. And um, Good Lord, one of the man. earliest things I remember really loving was comic strips in the newspaper. And it was a revelation that they bring them and lay it on your doorstep every day, especially Sunday when there were the co color funnies. And even before I could read, there were lots of silent strips like Henry or The Little King or strips that were so simplistic like Nancy and Sluggo. Hey, you, stop. I'm sure that really made me want to read more. Now, that comes in very close to uh, another thing I loved early on, which was the Superman TV series. Now, I, you're it, talking about the one that... George Reeves. George Reeves it, and, I and just, Black and White. Yes. Oh, faster than a speeding bullet. Of course. More power, more power, power, power. Yeah, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Um, that was Now, was that airing while you were a kid? Or is that in reruns? Like, I watched that in reruns. Well, yeah, I would have watched, let's see, let me see. I would have, the first time I came aware of it, I would have been like five or six. So it's the late 50s. Okay. And so, I don't know, I think it started in 51. By the time I watched it, it was probably early in their rerun syndication deal. I don't know. I had no idea that there were episodes in color because I had a black and white TV. Oh, my God. Years later. I mean, it's so funny. The first time I saw color TV, Huckleberry Hound is blue? <laughs> no, there must be something wrong with your tuning. And he's a dog. That's just what, what, what color was he to you all those years? You know, tan. Like a brownish dog? Yeah, a light tan dog. I don't know. And that, You're just like, I give up. No, like, this is unreal. Who has blue dogs? No, but you always have There's it. no truth in this art. <laughs> yeah, they lied to me. Uh, no, but you could always, always see them in the comics, you know, right. in the comic books and so forth. But like I say, this was my own private thing. I just love Superman like I can't. No one else in the family, none of your other siblings. Not really. They, by that time, the older kids were watching American Bandstand and Hootenanny. They liked the folk stuff. 
stuff. And I guess we all sort of watch Mickey Mouse Club. Mm. Uh, any animation. The Great Equalizer. Well, yeah. And also, I mean, the, the Looney Tunes package that was released to television, you just couldn't beat it. It was like my favorite cartoons of so all. So damn good that they kept that same package in syndication for Forever. 50 years, yeah. pretty much, yeah. But uh, uh, then I discover the Superman comic books, and I think originally, oh, this is based on that that TV show of mine. That's hysterical. So I was saving up bottles, you know, returning to pop bottles, or you do uh, chores around the house, and they give you a quarter or whatever. And when I read the comics, it was a revelation because of the Mort Weisinger era, where it was so fanciful and so full of fantasy. Give an example from the, cats that don't know what that would be. Well, like the a bo- Superman story, the bottle, the city, bottle city, city of Candor, or the telepathic mermaid Lori Lamaris, or uh, or the Bizarros, or uh, the. Uh, um, it was just like I say, it, it, you, the 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 wacky stuff that you know about Superman came. From yes, and as people got older, obviously they disliked crypto, and you know it fell out of fashion. Yes, of course. But for a kid who grew up reading that, did you feel like you know? There's a lot of kids right now, not kids. Let's be honest, they're my age, who grew up reading one continuity of of DC comics, right? And then, as we know, just this year, DC was like, we're rebooting everything, uh-huh. and it's not a pocket universe we're done right and here we're starting again and there are a bunch of cats who were just like but that was the those greatest. were the real stories sure. how yeah. could they? did you have a moment like that when well the, what happened was um it's peer pressure because i went along with them for the longest time they were frowned upon in my house you could buy them for long trips or special occasions but for the most part my dad thought they were for morons why don't you read a <laughs> real book you know so he wasn't like uh all oh, your soft reading silly books he was more like if you're gonna read read literature. He, exactly i mean you kind of get a pass on classics illustrated right you know why are you why are you not reading great expectations the real dickens novel well i'm reading the comic book first so i get a good idea a great of what I'm, I'm what I'm in for, <laughs> right. uh, but I mean I read everything. I didn't care. I'd go to somebody's house and the girls would have all these Archie and Veronicas. I'd read all of those. I didn't care. Hot stuff, you know, uh, any of the Harveys. I didn't care. I love Dennis the Menace. He was my generation's Bart Simpson. Right, right, and, he right. just, and, and and Hank Ketchum had such a way with the with the implying great movement in his in his chaos that he would create. So there was I mean, a line in Dennis in a Dennis the Menace, you know, because he would do single. Sh- yeah, that image. was his most famous, the one panel gag. The one panel gag, but I it was a term that I fell in love with when I was a kid when I read it and it was uh it was Mr. Wilson, you know, and there's Dennis in the right. distance and Mr. Wilson's talking to a neighbor on the fence. He goes, "There goes the Mitchell kid. He's like a sonic boom with dirt on it." <laughs> I love that line. It stuck with yeah, me forever. forever. Exactly. I refer to Jason Mewes all the time. It's like, he's like a sonic boom with well, dirt on it. When you talk to younger people, you say, in the days before we had personal, well, now they're DVDs, but are even videotapes, where you can actually own a story right. and look at it over and over and freeze frame it. To us, comic books were that because you, in the summertime, it was a way to, of going inward and not having to go out and make friends. Right, right. So you could disappear into the world. I had these friends, uh, I, you'd, you'd find each other out, you know, one of us, he has a box of comics in his basement. Right. So I'd go over on a summer and it would be funny to get over there like at 9 a.m. and we wouldn't hear a peep out of us until lunch is ready at 1 We'd go and have lunch, come back, and we'd virtually not exchange two lines of dialogue. Just sitting, He'd give together. me his Green Lanterns. I'd give him my Batman. I remember making the progression from Superman to Batman because I'm reading Batman, and it seems to me I, uh, uh, those 80-page giants really stand out, and right. later the 100-page spectaculars because they Explain were— now, again, some cats listening are in yeah. the digital age. They're All like 80-page right. giants, yeah, yeah. giant size spectacular. There are comic books. Most people know the standard size of comic books, but periodically they would do, um, it, it, throughout the run of a comic book, right. you'll do an annual, which is like, hey, it's our year end special. The or, best of Superman or the best of the Flash. Yes. Collections. And I remember being able, I would buy them at the beginning of the summer and they'd last you all summer. Plus, you know, I was trying to copy the artwork. I was really into them. I loved them. I thought, I fancied myself. I wanted to be a, a, a cartoonist. I, I idolized Charles Schultz and I saw his setup, much like your podcast. I'm thinking this guy creates his whole world in a little studio in his house. Yeah. Never has to leave his wife, never has to leave the children, but the dogs are right there. I said, what could be better? He Is wrote a billion dollars from his, from his desk in his Whoa. house. 
I mean, that's that that's peanuts. Yeah. Massive, massive. Yeah. To this day, it's still generous. He's and not it, even here, and it, it's still generous. And it fractured me as a kid to see those kids with neurotic tendencies like that. It was revolutionary. That's so, what they say. Like it's weird because my generation kind of so came accepted of age that. With, yeah. yeah, totally. But you were of a period where you could like suddenly there was a car, a, car, a, a comic strip in the newspaper. That's very dealing with uh, a child who's depressed. Yeah, yeah, and with neurotic tendencies, <laughs> and also a character in Lucy that was just as mean as your older sister. You thought, you, and would get great joy out of bringing displeasure to poor Charlie Brown. Right. That, I thought, wow, because they never dramatized mean kids right. ever. Uh, but uh, you know, do you like, remember there's that one classic? Uh, I don't even know if it's Low Folks or Peanut Strip. Where it's like, uh, it looks like maybe it's Sherman and maybe, I don't know, Linus sitting on a curb. And uh, he goes, there's Charlie Brown. Here he comes. Good old Charlie Brown. He's walking past him. Last panel. How I hate him. <laughs> now, th- but it's funny. That's the very first Peanuts strip yes. ever. Yes. So you're Boy, right. that sets a tone. It's right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the very first one. And what a what a twist at, in that last panel. Um uh, but uh, so the, again, these are stories you can own. And with me moving all I think the it's time, it's so fun that, you, that I've never heard that before. The I mean, I guess I did a little bit myself with, with my friend Walter. But the let's gather together and read in silence. Oh yeah, and I remember <laughs> it's monastic yeah. in, in some ways. And when the summer we spent in uh, uh, in in New York, there was actually comic book clubs where you had to declare whether you liked Marvel or DC. <laughs> you know, it's like you, there's been throughout the ages. Adams Family, Munsters, right. Stones, Beatles, right. and in this case, it was Marvel or DC, Star Trek, and some other thing. Yeah, and some other remember. thing. I can't remember the name of it either. <laughs> but I do remember. I kind of liked my. Well, I was DC clearly, but I didn't want to offend my buddies because I wanted to read their Marvels. I wanted <laughs> right. to read the uh, Spider Man and the rest of them. Fantastic Four. What appealed to you more about DC over Marvel? Did, was Marvel too quote unquote scientific? That was the thing that always did it for me. I would be like, well, DC, it feels like these stories could happen. Like, you know, Batman wasn't bitten by anything radioactive. Right, he lost right. his parents and stuff. That's why Superman. I thought it was realistic. I thought a rich guy with unlimited means could actually do that. Right. You know, you could actually, even if the cave hadn't existed, he could have dug a cave. It didn't have the fantasy elements of Superman. Although when you grow up and read these books in retrospect, you laugh and say, how could I ever thought that that was a <laughs> real... That one was yes, more realistic yes. than or the, the other. Or the relationships they have with women. You know, that Lois is like a 12-year-old in her childish desire to unmask Clark Kent's <laughs> Superman. Obviously, it's 40-year-old writers writing for 10-year-old kids. Right. And that's what happened to me. A combination of things. Uh, I peer pressured out of comic books because the Beatles hit. So everyone the was just hormones like, we like kick music in. Now. Yeah, and we didn't, you wouldn't want your girl to see you with a, a Lois Lane comic book. Come on. <laughs> it would shred your dignity forever. So I I still liked them, but I knew I didn't have uh, you know, the 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 money to to buy the kink single and uh, keep up with comic books. So really when I was, uh, really when Marvel was coming into their own in like 64 or five in that era where it was just exploding. So like when they're putting together the Avengers. And, and they're taking like over that. DC because DC then was uh, dated. Right. You know, they were old fashioned formulaic and, you know, they were made to be. These are out- your grandpappy's comics. Exactly. You're meant to outgrow them by the time you're 12. Mm-hmm. So the, I didn't really get back into comics until I graduated from high school, back, came back to the States and got into college. And then I was going to LACC here in Los Angeles and there was the Bond Street bookstore, Cherokee Books and the Cahuenga newsstand. And especially in the old, in the bookstores where they sold old comic books, it was like, oh my God, your sense memory was flooded because you go, oh, I remember that one and that one. I'm not talking about Golden Age. We're talking about Silver Age. And that's when I really got into the whole history of it. I said, well, how did this, how did comic books stay 10 cents from 1938 all the way till 1962? Everything went up in price. I didn't know that they were reducing the page content as they, you know, stayed at 10 cents. Then they went from 64 pages to 48 to 34 to 22. Right. And eventually 
eventually when they got to 22, they said, we can't reduce it anymore. We're going to have to make them 12 cents, which is a huge, huge thing because <laughs> it didn't come out even. If you had a quarter, you could get two and a, and a piece and of bubble gum. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Left over. Exactly. So, uh, um, but uh, w- that's what I found fascinating because I wanted to know who wrote these books, who were the artists. We, I didn't know who Dick Sprang was. So you're like a proto geek, a, pr- a proto, I mean, how ironic that you're the proto geek. You are what the internet became. That's it. And you I'm, are the fan, like you're the person that would, do you ever write in to Stan Soapbox or a DC Comics? Well, right no, away. I'll tell you, I was on a soap opera at General Hospital and in one day walked Kerwin Matthews. And I just almost fell over. It was Sinbad from Seven Four. It was Sinbad, right. and I, I, I so was enamored of him. And also, too, our producer was one of the actors in the original Howard Hawks, The Thing. Okay. Well, Christian Ivey supposedly directed it, but what I'm saying is he was a tyrant that all the actors were afraid of. And in my naivete, I've been in all these famous monsters going, Jim, I didn't know you were in The Thing. And all the other actors are like trying to hold their laughter because later... He, I, he couldn't come down on me because I was sincere. Right, but he didn't, you weren't like someone else would have said that to him. They oh, been you were in the thing, but you were just like, holy shit! I know you're a legend. Yeah, and I thought the thing was a classic even then. Right, the later when all the other actors got me alone, they said, "Oh, that was so great when you got Jim." I'm going, "What do you mean got Jim?" They said, "Oh, didn't you see how red he turned?" I said, "No, I didn't really get." Oh, oh, okay. But you, they, they thought that was great because I had that over him and. He he was he didn't like actors he was ashamed that he had once been an actor and it was beneath him to acknowledge that he'd once been in a movie called the, the thing. thing even he didn't get what a great movie it was you could tell when you're talking to him eh, well we were just uh, you know it was a job's a job now let's get on with the work you know <laughs> But anyway, no, to talk about being a fan and writing into Smallville mail sack and hoping to get a, some original Did you? Artwork. Did no, you? No, I didn't, but I... Hoping I, you get original well, artwork. Well, T- Tim Matheson did. I went in and it, I, I said, uh, I have a letter from Timmy Mathiason. Is that anything to do with you? He goes, oh my God, I can't believe you know that. He did. He wrote in and got it Tim printed. Tim Matheson, yeah. the actor? Yeah, before he changed the spelling of his last name, it had an extra I-E and it was... It looked from like, Animal House, Tim Yeah, yeah, that... Kind of Tim Matheson. And you busted him on like, did you I write a letter bust to the him. comics? I just had an old of DC comic and I went, I wonder if Timmy Mathiason has anything to do, if I ever see him, I'll ask him. So eventually I bumped into him once at a, a, somewhere and I said, oh, Tim, Mark Hamill. Yeah, oh, you're friends with Bill Moomy. We had mutual friends. Uh, he says to me, I said to him, did you write a letter into Smallville <laughs> The only time somebody fell over. He must have blown his mind in half. Well, to finish that story, I asked Kerwin Matthews, could I interview him uh, on a tape recorder? And I eventually sent it into and got it printed in a magazine called FXRH, which is Film Effects by Ray Harryhausen, which was an early glorified fanzine. It had a glossy cover, and I was sort of proud of myself. And I was living with this girl, and I said, by Mark Hamill and Ann Wyndham. She didn't do anything, but, you know. Even then, we know how to treat our lady folks. Of course, of course. And uh, 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 it turns up now, because it was in 74, way before I met George Lucas, and uh, it really proves my bona fides in terms of being in that geek culture. Everybody knows I'm one of them. When I did comic book, the movie, they knew I wasn't going to take that approach of finding the most obese person and making fun of them in any way. I was totally one of them. I, uh, one of my early TV appearances was on a show called Canon. And like what you made me think of is when you said this is before the internet. Because when I met William Conrad, not only did I know that he had been uh, Matt Dillon on the radio Gunsmoke, okay. but I, I said, what, what was it like narrating the Rocky I and Bullwinkle I know show? it, I know it. And his eyes got giant big. How did you know that? And I just said, I used to go to the library on our homeroom periods and just look up microfiche. In other words, you could, you oh know. Oh, my God. You were waiting for the internet I to was. be invented. I was, because I'd go back and read re- reviews of, like, Arsenic Old Lace on Broadway. If I sound a movie and it's, oh, based on the Broadway play, then I'd look up the New York Times and i go, wow, the most expensive ticket to West Side Story was seven fifty. And you could see it up in the balcony for a dollar ten. Oh my God! In 1957. Right. So I was enamored. It was like a time machine. I loved all that stuff, and so I loved Rocky and Bullwinkle so much. I would look up articles, and his name came up. I mean, I've blown people's minds over the years. The, you know, the judge in my Trickster episode, the second one, the the when the, you were on the Flash. 
Yes, when the return of the trickster in part two, because they put them together and made a t- a movie out of it for overseas. Mm-hmm. But my point is, when I saw the judge, it was Parley Bear. Parley Bear was the original sidekick on Ozzy and Harriet. When you see his face, he's on every 60s, 50s and 60s show you've ever saw. Whether it's drama or comedy, he's everything from the Untouchables to Mayberry RFD. He's in that famous scene in I Love Lucy, where Lucy poses as Ricky's agent and demands that uh, this MGM executive played by Parley Bear, acknowledge the fact that Oscar and Dick, Rogers and Hammerstein, uh-huh. are very anxious to sign Ricky to a contract for their new musical. And he winds up saying, well, we wouldn't want to stand in his way. He's released. Uh- <laughs> he, 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 he's what? He's, re- he's released. And he had this wonderful back and forth with Lucille Ball had such great timing. And he was just astonished I said, you've got to bring, it's like working with Dick Miller. I said, I'd love to see your resume. Dick Miller, who made a movie in one day. I think Bucket of Blood was one day. That was it? Yeah. He was in Little Shop of Horrors. He's in everything. Dick Miller. He was in uh, Gremlins. Uh, Joe Dante yeah, adores the, he's him. The, he's, uh, he was the sheriff in, uh, or something? The, the Howling, he's the guy that sells him the silver bullets. Like, I don't believe in this crap myself, but <laughs> he's that guy, right? Yeah, exactly. And if you're enamored of those low-budget movies of the 50s, and 60s, those drive-in movies, you go, oh, my God. And you just had a salute to all these teenage movies, Get Yourself a College Girl and Ski Party and Winter a Go-Go and Beach Ball. He's in uh, more than half of them. So as is Aaron Kincaid, who was our killer croc on the animated series. Oh, really? So the few times that we got together with all the villains... It was great to meet like Paul Williams as the as the penguin and Richard Mole, who's so funny in person. You gotta get him on a podcast. He's got the wickedest, greatest sense of humor. That's one of the things about the Batman experience. It was joyful. And I you know, I didn't let on that I was such a comic book fan. I mean, I know Diane Pershing, who did Poison Ivy, had never read a comic book in her life. But she read the script and the scripts were good enough to know Stand there and just who, without, you, who yeah, that character I mean, was. She didn't need continuity. She didn't have to go back uh, and course catch not. up or anything yeah so um all right so wait i'm getting ahead of i know i know and it's so exciting so you're you fall out of comics you come back into comics later on are you already working at this point well yeah i'm on uh, let's see uh yeah i'm i'm uh the the first summer was here i didn't work and i did my first two semesters and by uh, the first summer i was here i did a show on melrose there was a guy at my brother's wedding uh michael franks who's like a cult artist. He's like Loudon Wainwright. He's got a following, but he's not really famous. And he'd written this original musical, which we did at the Horseshoe Theater on Melrose, now called the Zephyr Theater. And I was sort of this, the uh, Iago in this triangle of this black guy and this beautiful blonde girl who's just exquisite. I still can picture her after all these years. In fact, Tina from Black Pearl is named after that. Black Pearl is oh, yours. Yes, but this is, but I, like I say, I did that show and I was seen by pros, like casting people and people from the studios. And this one guy whose daughter was in it said, if you want, I'll take you to, uh, and you can get an agent. So I got an agent in uh, early, let's see, the summer of 69. I had, by the fall of 69, I had an agent and I... Uh, I graduated June of 69. The trouble is I couldn't work because if I did, I'd get drafted and go to Vietnam. Oh, so this is, a, this is the, all right. So, this so is I putting, was born, putting us historic. Yeah, I graduated in 1969. I was born in 1951. So, so you, if you worked, you were then eligible? Yeah, I'd be eligible for the draft. Uh, I had to stay in school is what I'm saying and keep okay. 12 and a half units. The pressure for me to work got so strong that uh, at City College, they didn't allow you to leave. You'd think nowadays you'd go and say, look, I'm going to miss four days of work, but I'll come back and lecture to the other kids of how you get a job and what you do and what's expected to be all part. But, you know, they have horse blinders on. They want you only to do theater. They look down on TV and movies. And so I had to, I looked at it as an acting exercise. I went to the, I got a part on the Partridge family. It was going to be like four or five days. I had to go to the head of the department and embellish on the truth because my mom really did have diabetes but i told him i had to go back to to san diego because she was going to the hospital i even moved myself to tears and i was lying (laughs) i was totally lying and what was interesting i was sharing a house with other guys that were in the department and i thought i can't risk this even though they're my friends you you even lied to them you kept well yeah i packed a suitcase and i went out there and i hitched to the valley and got a motel room and then what happened was the first day i there was an extra that i knew who had an apartment she let me stay in her apartment platonically for the rest of the run but it was a kind of embarrassing i later told sean 
John Cassidy, I would walk away from the studio about a mile because I wouldn't let anybody know I was hitching. And one day I was going to, I was hitching and the car pulls over and it's David who had already worked with for <laughs> right. several days. And he goes, what are you doing? And immediately spontaneous lying. I said, oh, my car's in the shop. And he says, well, where are you going? I said, you know, towards Hollywood. So get in. I told Sean this later, and he said, that's David. Because I said, what struck me as funny was he drove me over the Highland Pass, uh -huh. past Franklin, past Hollywood, and he got to around Sunset. And he goes, which way are you going? And I was going east towards LACC. And he goes, oh, I'm going the other direction. He dropped, pulled over and dropped me off. <laughs> Instead of going the extra few miles. But, uh, um, yeah, so I started picking up TV. You got that gig? That was the first gig? No, the first thing I ever got was a pilot that didn't sell. Then I did uh, the Bill Cosby show, the first, the one that wasn't as popular as his. Where he was it, like a school teacher? He was a basketball coach in a high school, high school. yeah. And Ivan Dixon gave me that first part, you know, who's since passed away, but I've always forever grateful because really the unions go, can anybody else play this part? And as long as the director says, no, I want him, you get in the union. Right. So I did that and I did uh, uh, the, the Andy Griffith show that did, it was called Headmaster and it was supposed to be sort of like Room 22. It was supposed to have relevance. Well, Andy <laughs> was really unhappy and I have bad memories. It taught me a lot about being a celebrity because I said, you got to remember there's only a little bit of takeaway that people are going to have from you. And if you're having a bad day and you act out or something, they're going to tell that story to their children and their grandchildren how, oh, Mark Hamill was a real creep and wouldn't sign or if whatever. If you're nice to people as it Mark comes Hamill, back. like, you know, they'll, they'll go, the people you're nice to, you take a moment to take a photo with them. They'll probably tell 10 people across, course, you know, you the know next week. you know that yourself. But if you go like, hey, man, no, fuck off. Right. They and will you, tell 400 people. Of course. They will talk about you until the end of days. Yeah. About and, you know, you, I get recognized more when I'm late for a plane and I'm running through an airport. Of course. Uh, if I'm wanting to get a table and we really help if the mater D recognized me, I could stand in the pose from the, <laughs> from the, the, movie. From the movie and hum <laughs> John Williams' theme and he still wouldn't recognize me. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, then I started getting TV work. I did a lot of TV, and I don't know. I looked, well, I looked online, and it said 73 was your first gig was a cartoon. That was not, that's not entirely true. What happened was I, was, I did those jobs I, was, I just told you about. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably more than I'm forgetting, Streets of San Francisco, but I probably I did a dozen TV shows. And then I got on a soap with... Actually, it was the girl I was living with, Ann Wyndham. Okay. And we, when we went into audition, I said, you know, we ought to pretend like we don't know each other. This is 1971 or something. Because in those days, they didn't have any of those storylines where they're, you know, it was strict. If they looked at us as being brother and sister and found out we were living together, Jim Young brought us into his office after about five months on the show and said, I don't want to catch you holding hands and pictures that in the soap magazines if you go to openings or you go to Westwood because people are going to look at it like incest and I'm going to have to let you go. So oh I my said, Lord, oh. just because you play brother and sister. Well, yeah, and what happened was when we read together, we said, how do you do? How do you do? And we acted like we didn't know each other and after we read the scene, they went, gee, you kids have a tremendous Tremendous amount of rapport. <laughs> I'd been working with her for four semesters. Right. We were in the same drama class. And uh, we did the Renaissance Fair together. And then we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And we moved in together and all of that. But uh, wait, and I, you wait, know, this is, wait, wait, wait. You did a Renaissance Fair? Did oh, I just several. let you gloss over that? I, I almost let you go. Oh. But I got I to gotta touch on that. You we were, were a Ren Fair guy? We were in the Ren Fest? We, we were in the Queen's Players, which was a group that was formed by people that had gone to City College. Phil Kellard, Anthony DeFont, Steve Pringle, all the biggies. And I was apprenticed in where you were in the chorus. We did like six shows a day. We did the, uh, the, the Arrest of Robin Hood. It was street theater right in the middle of the dusty paths. We did the main stage, too. We did the, the, the presentation of the Queen. We did something called Gamma Girton's Needle. Which is? About a whore house, rival whorehouses where the guys are all in drag. It's, uh -huh. a, it's a period piece from right. the Renaissance Fair. And it's filthy. You know, it's about and body you know, as they're, hell. they're keeping needles up their asses and all that stuff. <laughs> And like I say, once you got to know the company, they, you'd move in. One, this guy would leave and you'd move to a more prominent part. There was a real great give and take called um, um, the magic bone of, I forget, 
it was a corny St. Peter, whatever it was, but you'd be, you'd be in the audience and you'd come up and you'd have a hump or whatever and you'd get cured. You'd <laughs> and it was lots of ad libbing. Right. And, and once they saw, saw that you could handle yourself and not be at a loss for words, the only thing that was a no, no, Ron and Phyllis Patterson, boy, I still remember that name would dock you pay. We may making like $8 a day, baby. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they would dock you if you did anything that was anachronistic. If you made a reference to anything modern. So you couldn't be like, uh, you you know, and then there's mod. No, like out, oh, man. they kill you for that. Exactly. And a lot of times that's what got people in trouble. And uh, for me, I mean, really, you can ad lib if you remember to listen. Just listen. Don't plan, oh, I'm going to get this joke in. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. Just listen and be in the moment. Uh, so, yeah, I did that maybe twice up north, maybe twice. It was out in like Peru or something down here. Um, but that was in my school days. That was like in between jobs. I was also a copy boy at Associated Press for such a brief time. And Doing? I, I was, well, I had visions of the front page or at least Jimmy Olsen in at the Daily Planet. Right. Stop the presses, chief. I got a story that'll set this town right on its ear. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't like that. I was like mopping out the storeroom and, right. and cutting copy and putting it in a book. It was so boring. So it was one of those jobs that was handed from one LAC CC actor to the next. You know, this guy would say, oh, I'm leaving in two weeks if you wanted the job's yours. And so, you know, obviously you were doing that just so long until you got an acting gig and then you leave it behind. So it's training. It was kind of like doing improv, at, you know. Yeah, and also too it was downtown at Flower Street, and I only had a Vespa. I didn't have a car at that point. Uh, it was a miracle I survived. And the thing with me, I'm all in. If when I was down there, I really wanted to be a journalist. That's probably my problem. I just am like that uh, Zelig or something. I want to be something that people spend a whole lifetime doing. Right. It's like I told you, I took over the guy's radio show for a summer. We only did like 12 shows. And I realized, because the producer was saying to me, you know, you've got a gift for this. Let's do a package. And I realized, wow, I was only in the weekend. The Monday through Friday is a whole different ball game, you right. know, to compete in that world. And I realized you can't do it casually. You've got to be all in. And it's a real dedication that you have to have, a real skill. For some reason, voiceover is the only part of the business. It doesn't happen when you do Broadway or off-Broadway or movies or TV and people come to the stage door or whatever. But in voiceover, for some reason, people go, hey, <laughs> I do a really good Flintstone. Funny. <laughs> and, you know, people on the street or in airports or in Toys R Us or whatever <laughs> waiting online for a movie, there's so many people, I do Homer Simpson. And you go, <laughs> that's very good, you know. But uh, th for some reason, there's a higher proportion of people that think, I could do that. Right. Because it's just a voice. It's yeah, I do funny voices. They'll say, right. not realizing what great actors these people are. Uh, like I say, when when I got uh, you mentioned the very first voiceover thing I did, and we got sidetracked. Genie, genie. It was an animated version of I Dream of Genie. Right. Julie McWhorter, who later married Rick Dees, did a spot on. She got the cadence and the tenor of Barbara, Barbara Eden's Eden. voice. But she was meant to be like 16 or something. Now, the other characters, when I eventually worked with Larry Hagman, I told him about this. And I said, although if you offered me a million dollars and waved it in front of my face, I couldn't come up with an imitation Larry Hagman. I just couldn't do it. It's like right. imitate Robert Redford. Good luck with that. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but that wasn't the bit. I mean, she was the main person. Uh, she had teen friends or? Well, I, yeah, I found her on the beach, just like I wasn't in the service. I was, you know, just a high school kid. Mm -hmm. And my funny sidekick, Bob Hastings, who played Colonel Parmenter on the Kale's Navy, that obsequious sidekick to Joe Flynn. Oh, oh, yes, oh. sir. Absolutely, sir. You're absolutely right, sir. He was the ultimate uh, brown noser. Right. Uh, when I worked with him the first time, it was when McGovern was running against Nixon and he used to give me a hard time because I was a hardcore McGovernite and he would criticize my long hair. He was like my dad's age. Right. But when I got to talking to him, he had been around during the golden age of radio. I recognized him. He'd been on Sergeant Bilko. Mm -hmm. He'd been, I think he might've done a car 54, but I was really trying to ask him about when did you make the move from New York? Cause Bilko and car 54 were East coast and he was doing theater. And when did you come out here and blah, blah, blah. 
one of the things he told me, and I didn't realize uh, for again for comic book um, uh, trivia fans. He wasn't the original Archie on the Archie radio show, but he when he inherited the part when that guy, the first guy got drafted, he was the one who most identified with it and did it longer than anybody else. Jughead and Betty and Veronica were on the radio, and Bob Hastings was Archie. I never knew that. There was an Archie radio show? Oh, for many years. Now, of course, it's before either one of us were born. But my point is... Wait, it was a comic book first? Yeah, the comic book now is 70 years old. It, it debuted, I think, in 1940. And was so popular, they're like, let's do a radio show exactly wow. and it was during the war years like 42 43 44 that's why that guy got drafted let and me it, ask you this though as a person of that generation what is so endearing about the archie characters you got a guy who can't choose between the blonde and the brunette how has it lasted 70 years well you'll find out when you read my introduction to archie archives volume six coming massive from, fan here well not so much uh, you know listen i appreciate many different forms and what happened was I asked to be on the comp list for true crime or some book they were putting out at because you know I had written they published Black Pearl, Dark Horse, Dark Horse. So yeah. I named David Scroggy and Mike Richardson and those guys. And since I asked to be on this comp list for these uh, some books, they said you got to write an introduction. And I thought, well, it's too on the nose if I do an introduction for the Star Wars line. Right. Um, and there was aliens and predators, but the Brendan came to me and said, we really need somebody for Archie. And I had to, you know, one of the things I do is I'm very loyal. It's like, I love Jerry Lewis and I thought he was a genius when I was six years old. Right. Then when I grew up and it was not cool to admit you like Jerry, especially in front of the opposite sex, <laughs> I still was loyal to him. I would never put him down. Right. You know, they, the people say, oh, he's the worst. You know, he's like your annoying baby brother, you know, doing all that spastic crap. And I'd say, have you ever seen the Aaron boy? Have you ever seen, you know, I'd always defend him. I thought he was great. And uh, same with Archie. Archie, to me, when I was when I was really loving it, I was like 10, 11, wanting to be a teenager. I wanted the artwork was like luscious eye candy. I mean, nobody but like Dan DiCarlo draws girls at the beach so beautifully. Right. Those luscious girls. I mean, Betty and Veronica were just wow. And everybody wanted to have a, a kooky friend like Jughead. And to me, it was it was soothing. It was a natural progression from the little rascals who I love, the our gang comedies, to the Archies. And like I say, I wasn't, I wouldn't put my money down. I'd save my money for the ones I really like, but they were so, there was such a proliferation of those books. They were really popular in the sixties. So I, I readily read them and so forth. And like I say, you, you, you go by 10 years and you go, I wonder what they're doing now. It's the seventies or the eighties. No, you go, Oh my God, they've got the boom box. They've got the iPad. Slightly updated, it's, they're yeah. always the perennial teenagers. So I took it on to go ahead. Cause I owed it to dark horse. And I said, you've got to be unapologetic. You read Archie's and you liked them. Why did you like them? And even though it took me, I don't know, three and a half weeks to write the introduction to the Joker book, Archie took me months because I think I couldn't get a hook <laughs> right. into why I liked it. For me, I need to either know the last line, which I did for the Joker, which is it's been the greatest ride of my life, the most challenging, the most delightful, the most invigorating exuberant experience i've had as an actor and that's no joke right. i knew that's where i wanted to land it right with archie and you know how it is with writing it's, it can strike you when you're going to sleep when you're driving and you can't control when you'll get you know you get bored in a movie you also have a thought you go, oh i should write that down uh, and I think my Archie starts out, you know, I never believed in the concept of a second childhood, maybe because I have, I'm not finished with my first mm, nice. because I never really, uh, I never really outgrew. I knew there was some point you got to stop idolizing Daffy Duck. Right. It's or just, do you? Well, that's it though. I mean, uh, you, you say I outwardly can do conform. I'm a coward in that way. You know, I'm not going to let on because I want to fit in. Mm -hmm. There's a theme here. They just fitting in. Uh, you come into a new neighborhood and you see a kid sitting on the curb reading comic books and you go, that's, I got to meet him right away. Right. That'd be the first point of contact. So I use comic books in a social way to get to know people. And of course, up to a certain age, all your friends are boys anyway. Right. Um, you, you know, this is going to sound weird, but you know what it was for my generation, which right? Which one? Star Wars figures. Oh, the figures. Okay, again. Many times the the the, the 
afternoons that you describe of like uh, pairing up with a dude or a couple dudes sure. not quietly reading in a room in our generation that became action figures. But that's better because you're using your imaginations and you're coming up with scenarios and you're actually interacting. The comic book reading is very much a solo activity where you're focused on one thing. But I was all over the board. I, I, I fell in love with Ray Harryhausen and stop motion. I loved King Kong. I mean, Kong. if you recognize Sinbad when he came in, then clearly you were a Harryhausen guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, So wait, you're in... So at this point now, uh, Genie. Genie, Genie, but I'm on the soap opera. And what struck me is... Uh, I didn't finish with the cast. There's Julie, there's Bob Hastings. The reason there's foreshadowing because Bob Hastings, 20 years later, will be Commissioner Gordon on Batman the Animated Series. How weird is yeah. that? Yeah. And uh, the, the last member of the cast, they thought to goose up the comedy, Genie should have a junior Genie, a bumbling, you know, goofy guy who's trying to master magic but gets it wrong and flips upside down and turns, you know, just creates chaos. And so Junior Genie Babu was created and it was made in the image and voiced by Joe Besser, one of the last of the original Three Stooges. He was, he was in, when Shemp died, they had two more years on their contract. They hired Joe Besser. Well, you might know him as Stinky from the old Abin Costello show. Wait, was Not he? so hard. So he was Yabble Dabble? I'm going to pinch you so yeah, hard. Yeah, 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 he was Yabble Dabble. And the thing was, Again, I mean, this guy had fractured me on Abnica Solo. I loved when Stinky showed up because clearly he was a grown man in this little Lloyd Fotheroy outfit. It was <laughs> surreal as hell. Right. I come here. I want to play with. I want to play with a kid. Abbott would, you know, he's just. Yeah. Abbott was like the scary dad that might slap you, you know. <laughs> he was so. Go on, play with him. What's wrong with you? I mean, he was into the surreal. He didn't ever acknowledge he was a 45 year old man <laughs> wearing a boy's yes, outfit. Yes, with a little hat and the ribbon. So, I mean, he was a gentle soul. I mean, God knows he must have been in his 80s at that time and he had a hearing aid. He was devoted to his wife. And as much as I tried to prompt him, he wasn't one of those people that was on. You know, he was very pleased that I knew his work and everything. And he actually told me how Lou Costello used to stare at his act every night from the wings. And he was convinced a lot of, he stole a lot of his chops because they both played man children. Yeah, kind I'm of. I'm a big boy. boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, but I got a lot. And he talked about being the Stooges. He said, you know, I just didn't like the eye poking. That's one of the things that a lot of Stooge fans don't like him because he said to Mo Howard, I don't want to get into all that stuff. Let's do. And they were getting more into the sitcom era where there was less, there were no saws across the head or, right. uh, 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 you know, pliers on the nose at that point. But to me, uh, to me, I love uh, bumping into uh, show business figures from the past that, you know, I always thought that too bad they don't have a talk show where they're not worried about your latest TV show, your latest clip, or your latest drop in That's the CD. That's what Joe role. Franklin used to yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. Joe Franklin, I'm telling you, or Steve Allen. Mm -hmm. He'd have guys on just because they were funny. He'd book Paul Lind. He'd book Lenny Bruce. He'd book anybody that could make you laugh, and I love that. That's Pat what we're trying. We're doing this show right now Pat on Hulu called Spoilers. Uh -huh. And we're, we have a guest for every show. It's a show where you take people out to the movies. I take 40 people out to the movies, then we sit around and talk about the movie. Then we uh, do the second half of the show's interview part. Right. Carrie, Kate, Carrie Fisher came in oh, and yeah. interviewed Carrie. Last week we interviewed Damon Lindelof. Um, the idea is to kind of p grab people who aren't like, hey man, I'm promoting something. Right. Just grab people who are talkers. Yeah. Like you are it's, on the list. It's, it's a You whole... are a, a fucking talker, man. You're a content generator. It's amazing. Well, you get a completely different aspect of it's because talk shows used to be about interesting diverse people from different backgrounds coming together like jack parr mm -hmm. and and talking about issues or a movie or politics or whatever it was now it's so honed down to you can't even get booked unless, unless you have you're pitching something unless you're pitching something, something yeah. exactly so so yeah i did genie and it one last aspect of it that was interesting before we leave genie was it was the last show that was directed personally by joe barbera after that he retired Step back and became well, kind he, of more of the he producer figure. yeah he was behind the scenes he didn't retire till years later because this must have been 72 yeah it would, it would have been because i remember the the uh nixon race um but we sat around a table and it was for me you know, Dawes Butler, 
John Stevenson. Uh, you All know, the voices of your from, childhood. Yeah, from Huckleberry Hound and 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 Yogi Bear and all of it. You know, uh, back to uh, Rough and Ready. I mean, the you, you just recognize those voices like nobody's business. Uh, Don, uh, I said Don Messick, but uh, there was another one. Well, I, I shouldn't bring people's names up because you always leave somebody out. But it, again, I was totally in awe, like going to a museum of animation. Yeah, but Hanna Barbera wasn't my favorite, but it was better than no cartoons, right? Mr. Jinx. And you Pix- always notice the difference, too, between Pixie Looney Tunes, even as a kid. Oh, yeah. Like, if you didn't know the terminology, if you didn't know the difference between 24 frame animation. Yeah, or limited, and animation. limited animation. Yeah, yeah. You would always be like, wow, the Bugs Bunny just tries harder or something. You yeah, didn't know how to put the it. The cartoon characters would move in unison. And one thing about uh, Hanna-Barbera, whenever they ran, it would be the same, same foot of backgrounds. Like, Fred would go by the same house 32 times. Yeah, well, I noticed all that kind of stuff, and I loved it all. Um um, all right, so wait, you're on the soap opera at this point. Yeah. Um, and I'm just finishing up with with my fourth semester when my number got pa- picked and I, it was clear that I wasn't going to get drafted. They wanted me to stay, me to stay one more semester because by that time I'd been nominated for Best Actor for this and that and I'd gotten into the directing program. Uh, you know, my enthusiasm for theater was as strong as anything else. And so they they were going to do a theater. They did every year. They would do an entry into the Ford's Theater Festival, where they play the same theater where our 16th president was assassinated. Ford's Theater, and the Jerry Blunt, the head of the department, you would you would get twelve and a half twelve units for just one for that participation in that just going there to that production. You, it was all year, and you honed it, you toured it, and then you went and you competed against all the other schools. And the thing is, I got the concept, but mentally I wasn't ready for it because I had played in The Warrior's Husband where all the genders were reversed. Okay. The Warriors were the women. It was a big hit in the 40s. I mean, we're doing theater where the staff is, they don't want to do Neil Simon. Right. It's too modern. So <laughs> I get cast in The Warrior's Husband playing a spoiled prince that was the equivalent of a spoiled girl. Okay. And... I had to wear a rehearsal skirt in because eventually my costume would reflect a short tunic and I couldn't get it because he wasn't gay. Right. He was with a woman, but she was the strong warrior and they cast this girl that was six, two and Oh, she, Jean. Um, I can't remember her last name now. Frost, Jean Frost. Wonderful. But I couldn't get, what do I do? And then I finally had um, a revelation because I'd seen st- Gwen Verdon on Broadway in Sweet Charity. And so it was like a winsome, winsome quality, almost like a, like if you were a cherub or a pixie or mm. a magical creature. You didn't have to be, because I didn't want to be fae. Right. Because well, let's face it, there's a lot of guys in the drama department that say, come on, face it, you are gay. Right, right, right. <laughs> Believe me, everyone is. Right. Oh, shut up. Lee Marvin's not gay. Are you kidding me, uh, Lee? Right. Right. You know, everybody is gay. <clears throat> But anyway, I found the key, whatever it was, Mary Martin and Peter Pan or Gwen Verdon and Sweet Charity, I found the way to do it. And it was, whoa, it came at the last couple of, I mean, we were opening in three or four days and I I, I found it. And uh, it was a funny character. I mean, once you got and found out who this pampered brat was with a fan, I worked that fan and snapped people on the nose. I mean, <laughs> we did a preview with the, with the department in attendance and, you know, I got a standing ovation. It was just wonderful. So Jerry Blunt sees that and goes, I've always wanted to do Shakespeare the way they did Shakespeare where men played the women's parts. Mm-hmm. So I can't remember the play. It might've been Henry the fourth part one or whatever it was his intention had i stayed a fifth semester was me playing a woman but see that's different now that i'm really playing a woman right <clears throat> and my head wasn't there i mean i was 19 20 i don't want you know i thought uh if the draft was still on that would have been a great motivator <laughs> right but right. once that was over and I, I i had you know established myself as doing tv and so forth i wanted to get back to new york and do theater so i uh, once the, the draft was over and I did two years at City, uh, that was it for me. I kind of regret it now. I should have probably transferred to USC or UCLA, but you know, 
hindsight's twenty twenty. In fact, I sometimes I wish I'd gone to the film department. They don't mesh the department. Say, you know, the theaters, the theater, mm -hmm. the TV department's the TV department, the film department's the film department. You think it's all of a whole. I mean, you should, you know, the actors from the theater department should go be in those student just films. Be the arts. Yeah, the ar I agree. I totally agree. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, so. Uh, that was that was that night. It was ninety. It was seventy two. I didn't get to Batman until ninety two. Good lord! So there's twenty years between your first. And I, yeah, and I said voiceover my, gig. Yeah. And well, I, no, that's not true. There what? is another important voiceover gig. <sighs> wizards. Yes, and Ralph that's what Boxing. I want to ask you. At this point in your life, when you get <clears throat> Wizards, it's around the same time as the other movie, right? Which are you more excited by? Working with Ralph Bakshi, or like, hey, we're doing like a kind of modern day Buck Rogers? If we're well, Wizards happened before I found out. Uh, it was Robert England, who's Freddy Krueger. Said I was hanging out with him and uh, his girl, and we were over when I was doing Texas Wheelers with Gary Busey and Jack Elam over at uh, at. Um, uh, Radford, you know, mm -hmm. the CBS television over there where they did, uh, you know, Mary Tyler Moore and Rose. Where we shot Jane Silent Bob. There you go. Back. 70s show was there, Jane Silent Bob. It's a nice little it's intimate perfect. studio, yes. yes. It's Seinfeld not shot there, exactly. shot there. You don't have the trams going through with the trailers, and everybody kind of knows everybody. Goes, oh, there's John Lithgow from Third Rock, and it's cool. Everybody's, uh, you know, uh, it's a real family feel. Uh, so he was living right near there. I was doing Texas Wheelers. And after he had been rejected, you know, he's a smart actor. You don't tell people about it when you're still up for it. Right. Once he realized he wasn't going to be in it, he goes, have you been up for the George Lucas thing? And I said, the American Graffiti guy? Yeah. Is that what he was known? Was American yeah. Graffiti was pretty huge. It was a big hit. Oh, yeah. And a sleeper. No one saw it coming. Uh, so I said, no, no. But he tipped me off. Um, with wizards, again, I forget who put me up to that because I know I read for the part that was the lead and didn't get it. Romano, I forget his name. He's got a really interesting name. And I didn't get it, but I was sort of relieved because Bakshi was not an easy guy to work with. In fact, I, I was a big fan of uh, Fritz the Cat. Right. Which is, the, for, for those that don't know or don't remember, the, the first X-rated cartoon. That's right. And Based was, on the Robert Crumb underground comic. The underground comic, which now when you think about Fritz the Cat, like it wouldn't be X-rated today. No, they I mean, do they do so, worse stuff guy on Family and, Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but uh, he did the voice of the policeman in that, the, that movie, like in the comics, not so subtly, were pigs. Right. And I loved his vocal characterization because I said, I read in the end credits, who did the policeman? Oh, Ralph Bakshi, you know, the guy. And so, I mean, I might have gone on a bad day because I know uh, after a little encounter with him, he went to lunch and his assistant said, don't take it personally. That's just the way he is with everybody. You know, he just loves to vent and act out. Because I said, I don't want this job. And because he was, you call that a fucking pixie. I never, come on, be, be more of a pixie. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking, wow, he talks like that, you know. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, ruffle any feathers all these years later because, you know, God knows, he, you know, I only worked with him a day. Right. It was like two lines and I get killed. <laughs> but I do, I know I auditioned several times and it was between me and the guy who actually got it. And it was a relief for me because I wasn't used to working with caustic directors. I mean, the only one that compares was Dick Donner. He did, the last movie he did before he went to do The Omen was Sarah T with Larry Hagman, Verna Bloom, William Daniels and Linda Blair was the star. Now I had just seen The Exorcist like, within a year. I'm just like, whoa, because that that and Alien, I was more scared in the theater watching those two movies than probably anything I can remember. <clears throat> and I, I just couldn't get over how normal a girl she was, giggly right. and like any 15 year old girl. I should have known better because I said, wasn't it like creepy and scary on the set? She goes, no, I couldn't see my own makeup. When I was on the bed, it was like a a ride at Disneyland with all the grips making it go up and down. She says it was really cold because they refrigerated the set so the breath would come out. Right. Now they'd CGI, CGI it, of course. Up. But uh, so it was kind of a revelation. But Dick Donner gave me a really hard time because I was supposed to be playing a really proficient horseman. In fact, part of the plot was at one point she hit my car and killed my horse with a car, you know, and I had this very dramatic scene where I found my dead horse and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, like on any audition, do you ride? Yes. 
Right. Now, I had ridden. I'm not a really proficient. I don't know all the terminology and whatnot. And he sensed that and used to really get on me in front of the crew. Now, I can take good news in ribbing, but he right against the line of just being a sadist. Really? Yeah. And one at one point, I just blew up and I'd never done that before, certainly not on a set. And just, I forget what I said. I just railed and said, ah, I can't even concentrate with your... You know, you know, whatever it was. I hate you, whatever. Like a teenager. And I ran to my trailer and I, when I got that all out of my system, I went, oh no, I'm going to be on the bus going back. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I just lost this job. I just lost this job because no one would talk to Dick Donner that way. And the AD came, yeah, what? Come on in. I said, what, what happened? Well, we just want to know you're off till after lunch. And I said, I'm still on. He goes, oh yeah, I should tell you. When you ran off, Dick loved it. No one. He was waiting to see how long it would take for you to stand up to him. He just adored your reaction, and he never picked on me again. Larry Hagman later said, "Oh, I should have told you about that." You know, he has this uh, uh, thing where he goes on a set, and the weakest among the group is the one he'll single out. And he couldn't do it to Larry. He couldn't do it to William Daniels. They couldn't do it to Linda Blair. She was the star. All right. She played Sarah T. What was it about? What it was Sarah T. About? Sarah T. Portrait of a teenage alcoholic. Oh, okay. So she got drunk and got in a car and hit my horse. <laughs> not the not really good for a relationship. No. You know, it's really hard to get over that. But uh, like I say, um, as soon as I did that. He's one of the nicest guys in the world. I mean, Ugh, I'm, I don't dig that though. It's like, come on, don't play a game. Well, you are like me. I like the drama on the screen, not on the set. Exactly. And I have to admit, one of the things that I remember most about working with you was how fun the, everybody on the crew was, how much fun all the actors were. I mean, I remember seeing it for the first time put together, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. And I went, oh, that's right. Because all I could remember was laughing all day long. All right, all right. Looking at that ridiculous hubcap on Jason's <laughs> head, and you and him together were so, I mean, we're in this big Adam West bat cave. I said, it was and when I met your parents, she, potpourri. well, also, too, when I talked to your parents, they said, you know, it was not too long ago that Kevin was playing with a little miniature <laughs> version of you and putting him on his set. Now he's in the life size set putting you where he wants. So there was great uh, continuity there. And uh, again, just having your parents on the set, who does that? It's yeah. such a family thing and your crew goes from movie to movie to movie with you um i couldn't like believe they gave me that much money i was like you guys have to come see they they let me build a, a bat cave kind of yeah come see oh it. yeah what a great set that was my only disappointment was i went oh good chris rocks in the scene and you shot him out separately separately so yeah. i never met him and i again of course i'm who's not a big fan of his comedy but uh, uh uh what struck me when i finally saw it in westwood was how serious I was, because I was playing sort of this full of himself actor who was playing cock knocker who couldn't abide the antics of you two. <laughs> and it's a bizarre scene because it's like everyone's on a movie set, yet lightsabers work. Yes. There's a score. Of you know, it, it's definitely, it, it plays a lot with, of course. with the reality, but it's such a. Uh, Damn fun scene. But, you know, okay, so you got me, Wizards and Genie. And what when I look back, I say, why didn't I pursue that? Because I really enjoyed the process the of doing, work. oh, yes, of the Genie show. Now, I knew Genie was what it was. Uh, it, it, you know, we were number one in our time slot that first season. And for the second season, they just ran the first. I said, <laughs> That's crazy. So, so like we built something, and now we're we just took a nose dive. Well, in those days, a lot of times kids would watch you over and over. But in that kind of competition, we only ran one season, which was like I say, after the first season of being the number one show, not just on CBS, but all Saturday morning. I said, "Oh, good, this kid's going to last four, five, six seasons. We'll go like a Scooby Doo." Yeah, <laughs> and it didn't happen. Did they? Ha and did you know about residuals at that point? No, did they yeah. already have them. And yeah, stuff? yeah. So that oh, was sure. like the golden egg, right? Of there. course. Like, oh. Yeah, and I thought it's the ultimate anonymous acting because nobody that I care about is going to be watching this thing. Right. Thank God, because I was sitting around one day and Hoyt Curtin came in. I didn't know who he was at first, but when I realized who he was, I went, oh, he wrote Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, meet George Jet. Hey, if there's a he music... Is the, he is the lyricist and music... And music. the music guy for everything that... And the greatest show in town is Huckleberry Hound for all you guys and gals. And, uh, <laughs> Mag uh, see in the window, Magilla, Magilla gorilla, 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 gorilla for sale. Yeah. Appeal. Try him, buy him, <laughs> take him out and try <laughs> him, gorilla really for sale. Yeah, yeah. So... 
again. If you wanted a gorilla, you could call <laughs> your own. A gorilla who be with you when you're all alone. Now, see, now, how can you remember that? I will remember that, dude. I will be dying yeah. one day. And as I'm dying, one yeah. of the one of the last we synapses. Got a gorilla for sale. Of course. Magilla, gorilla for sale. It's a comforting song that sings to every child that yes. says, Could and you imagine having this awesome friend slash pet? A friendly gorilla, right. <laughs> who's house trained and has snappy comebacks for yes. everything. Well, what happened was he said to me, he goes, he stuck his head out and was looking at his watch. Do you sing again with the horse? Do you ride a horse? I right. go, yeah. Now I had done musicals like Charlie Brown and you know I could do How to Succeed but I'm never going to do Billy Bigelow and Carousel I just don't have the chops no we've seen Luke be a Jedi tonight there you go so you can carry it too I can sing Happy yes. Birthday but I can't sing Sweeney Todd um, <laughs> I don't know you could, you but, could maybe do uh, Toby yeah there you go so I said an aging Toby so I said uh, yeah and uh, it doesn't exist anymore because Genie only exists chopped up in an hour compilation show you know the flintstones good time comedy hour oh they don't have like its own no no run. no because we only did 22 or something of them but what happened was uh i sang the title track he said he told me he said no you're just going to be a fill-in singer the guy's late or whatever it's a click track so you're like scratch track yeah exactly and then they like just it the way so i much. did scooby-doo on your movie so uh but no, they thought it was good enough. I don't think they liked it so much, but they but just, they went with it. They went with it. Do you and remember the song? Any of it? Hot dogging it up, riding high on the curl, <laughs> not thinking about I'd be meeting a girl. Then wham, I land, but the fall wasn't all. In a bottle was a genie, only two inches tall. Out came genie, a junior genie, babu, yapple dapple, genie, sort of like George Jetson on the hey. treadmill. So it was a classic of that. And it tells the entire story. You never need to watch the episode because it's like, a, well, there's the story. Don't you remember that? Here's a story of a lovely lady <laughs> yes. or uh, the, the, the Gilligan's Island. They don't even do opening theme songs. They don't even no. do openings to shows anymore. It's just a, a, a credit that goes over the picture. They start right you away. You can't go longer than 15 seconds like Frasier. <laughs> That's it. Watch the city get drawn and then. Because people will switch you off that fast. So, uh, yeah, and like I say, I loved animation so much. I said, I wonder why I didn't pursue that. Because I was more single-minded about wanting to do theater, and I don't know, it just didn't occur to me. It, w what woke me up was cut to 19, 20 years later, I'm reading the Comic Buyer's Guide, and I said, oh, wow, Warner Brothers ordered 13 weeks, 13 times 5 is 65. They wouldn't blow them all out. You know, they'd stretch them out much longer than that. But in those days, an order of 65, only I think DuckTales had gotten an order like that. So you were like, wow, they're ordering a big Batman They're ordering show. a huge batch of super, uh, of, uh, and of this Batman. And here after Tim Burton's 1989 <laughs> Batman. Yes, yes, happened. exactly. In fact, uh, they were, we came out right after Batman Returns, which is why the Penguin looks one way in the early episodes and then they got mm -hmm. their way later because we had to follow the Tim Burton with the web hands. hands and real Dickensian evil and instead of the erudite you know guy that he was in the comics um but my point is one of the things that stuck out in my mind was them saying that our models for the show are going to be these these uh, Fly, Max Fleischer Superman cartoons yes which I, I remember seen. that article man and yeah. there was a there was they also released an image of Batman standing which, up on the building, yes, which is on the, the cover of I believe that very book there. It's somewhere in that, it's somewhere in that book. Well, from there. the opening titles, yes, there. It, it was a, it was kind of a promotional image, and it looked like the Max Fleischer version, yeah, yeah. of Batman. A Max Fleischer version is the what was it? It was a, it was made for cinema. <laughs> it right? was it for Paramount made. cartoons, yeah. And in those days, I mean, uh, the, the budgets were almost a million dollars, which in 1940 was unheard of. Yeah. I mean, they lost money because they were so expensive and they rotoscoped real people. You never saw action cartoons quite that way again. And since it was so early in Superman's career, that was right in the period where he went from leaping in a single bound to actually flying. Because in the cartoon, the, car, the tail was wagging the dog dc was watching listening to the radio show that's where they got kryptonite and that's where they named the office boy jimmy olsen so much of the uh the uh, iconic things from the comics happened in radio or the serial or especially well i say especially the radio followed by 
the uh, Superman cartoons. Um, you the know, Fleischer the, cartoon. Yeah, the Fleischer cartoon, the whole thing with Lois being in peril and, mm-hmm. and the, you know, Bud Collier doing the higher voice for Clark and the lower for Superman, the which I, you know, Kevin Conroy to me is the one uh, Bruce Wayne Batman that really consciously does a different voice, I think. You know, I guess Michael Keaton and Christian Bale and, and uh, George Clooney and Val Kilmer all speak in their regular voice. And then when they're Batman, they're a little bit more gritty or whatever. But uh, Kevin's voice, his voice for Bruce Wayne is even different from his own voice. Yes, it's higher. It's a, it's a higher uh, pitch. And what's interesting, because Kevin's approach is that the disguise, the re- the real person is Batman, right? But the Bruce Wayne is the affectation because he's always Batman. He's always driven. He's always. And that's why his Bruce sounds always sounds a bit performed. Because yeah, he's not sort of. Yes, and and clueless. He's sort of real. a vapid. A himbo, if you will. <laughs> right. And yeah. uh, um, they were the first to do that, too. They took, like, you know, normally you look at Batman in, in previous animated form, and he's a guy with a cape on. Right. But they made Bruce Wayne and Batman barrel chested. Yeah. Like, made him look like if this is a guy who's going to be punching people in the face all night. They long. were influenced by Alex Toth's designs of Space Ghost. Really? Yeah, in the design of him, in this simplicity. Because you have to remember, because I was a little disappointed. I'm getting ahead of myself again. I said to my agent, look, they're going to do 65 of these things. I want in. You know, if I'm Batman, which I never read for her, I think I learned of it too late. I think it had already been cast or whatever. But my story with it was, as soon as I said I want in, within a couple of weeks, they said, you're in an episode. I said, wow, I don't have to audition? No, no, they're sending you a script now. It's the first Mr. Freeze episode. I said, am I Mr. Freeze? No, that's Michael and Sarah. Oh, all right. (laughs) Because my ego was, I want to be Mr. Freeze. So I read this thing. It's called Heart of Ice. And I read the script, and I'm just stunned. I said, it's so, I mean, you almost cry at the end. This is a very melancholy adult approach. I never heard of Mr. Freeze in the comics where he was Mr. Zero and then Mr. Freeze and then he was Otto Preminger and then he was Eli Wallach on the, on the 60s William Dozier series. But this version where he's a tragic figure trying to figure a way to preserve his wife who's dying of this. Nora. Uh, that breaks your heart. I'm telling you. Written by Paul Dini. Of course. So that's my first encounter with the writing of Paul Dini, who later became my famous, my favorite Bat, uh, Joker writer. Now, there were other Joker scripts, I should be fair, because I always mention Paul because he's become a personal friend of mine, but he always had you know, brought something extra to the table, something that really you didn't get to do before. I'll, I'll never forget that speech in The Man Who Killed Batman where Joker eulogizes uh, Batman man thinking he's dead killed by this little gone uh what's his name sid i forget his last name john vernon oh what a voice he had oh please but he wrote this dear friends we gather today to mourn the clown that this is the day the clown cried and i'm reading this eulogy and it starts out Sort of, you know, very dear friends and very yellow submarine blue me. Oh, my God. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you. I'm in the fucking shower this morning, and I'm, I'm going like, boy, there's a zillion things to ask him. And I'm sitting there going over the Joker voice in my head. And I said, you know what, man? I wonder if there's any blue meaning in that. The guy that's like, love. Lovey dovey. Oh, of course. That is so funny. Because I weird. thought, you know wow. what? I, I had this image of the Joker having to rein in his madness because just like any other there's mood swings and so i said if i could give the impression that he's teetering like maintain you know like like when, drunk with madness yes trying to pass in or, front of or a yeah if you smoke pot and then you're around your parents <laughs> right. maintain maintain that's not funny right. you know bite the inner sides of your cheeks and so i wanted him sort of teetering on the edge of madness and part of the thing was that when i went in see what i'm getting ahead of myself again I, so I do Heart of Ice. I go in and I meet everybody and they have all the backgrounds around the walls, all those luscious... Drawn on black paper. Yes, as, as, I didn't know that Paul then, but us, yeah. magenta and it was deep, it was art deco and it was weirdly paradoxical because it was futuristic, but it was retro. It sort of looked like the 30s, but then there would be blimps and I, I just <laughs> it just blew my mind. It always brings the blimps into it. It's true. Right. The blimps were this real... I mean... 
they never celebrated in, uh, th- them that much in the episodes. They weren't really. There was no episode I can think of that was blimp. Uh, well, centric. how about the opening credits? Always, but that's what the a blimp, blimp played. Turns the into security the, lights that t- turn into the from the Warner Brothers logo into the blimp. Well, and in any case, they also had this long uh, 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 lineup of Batman, Commissioner Gordon, all the main characters, including the Joker, which is the one with his hand on his hip and his finger up in the air. People will know. Style sheet Joker, exactly. essentially. And like these char- number one. Yes, and all the characters, I thought, well, they're awfully two-dimensional. I mean, compared to the Luscious, I didn't realize how that was a design to make them pop right. from those 3D backgrounds. And I'd forgotten to look at them with an animator's eye because one of the reasons, you know, Batman is drawn in, in the way he is without cross hatching or anything is that when you move him, you want to keep him as simple as you can so you don't have any, uh, you know, it's like, why did we wear those stupid hats in Empire so that when they did the miniatures, they didn't have to deal with the hair flying? Right, right, right. So there's, there's practical reasons for the designs. But I was just so enamored of it and you know i'm bursting with excitement um i i i I, i'm reading the script because i was playing ferris boyle who runs the corporation you don't get to wear a costume you're not an arch villain you're you're the the, businessman of the week although it was interesting because andrea pointed out this andrea romano the director and i think bruce tim was there i don't know if paul dini was there i should ask paul were you there the very first day but you know at least in my character he had a public persona this big Bruce, Bruce. I was channeling Phil Hartman at the time. Oh, right on. Nice to see you, Bruce. And I just imagine him being a, a big phony because when you see him in doing press conferences, he's completely different than he's when he's with Victor. You know, wh- wh- who told you you could use company equipment? What are you, crazy? You know, all that stuff. So I had this big tussle with him, and I wound up pushing him into the solution. And Michael and Sarah, who I, as a kid, I remember watching Broken Arrow, he used to be married to Barbara Eden. And he's this very passionate actor. I don't know whether he's Spanish or, you know, what his background or Italian, Michael and Sarah, I, you know, you could probably figure it out. Sounds Latin. But he's, he's nothing if not very passionate. You know what I mean? He's a hot-blooded actor. So for him to struggle mightily, I would weep if I still had tears to shed. You know, and they would say, oh, it's a little too much emotion. This poor guy is trying to flatten out his reed and he's struggling mightily because it goes against every instinct he has in his body to not interpret the lines more. Right. And I could see, because I closed my eyes and listened, and like I say, I mean, it's a pun, but he truly was chilling and when he got it right. And I thought, boy, are they doing justice to this script because it's just how I, I imagine it because the, the, the image that I'll never forget is at the end when he's got the snow globe and they're pulling the camera out and he's in that refrigerated cell and she's just going around in the middle. I said, boy, they're not aiming this at nine-year-olds. They're doing that thing where it's like the Simpsons. The grown-ups can watch or with Rocky the kids. Or Rocky and Bullwinkle back course, in the day. Where the whole family can pick something up that they like about it. So I was just nuts. And so when it was all over, I know I was saying... I was a million questions. Are you going to do some that don't have villains? Are you going to do like Rasha Ghoul? Are you going to do characters that weren't on the TV show? So they're clearly like going, Scarecrow and who knew this guy was Dr. An Hugh, fan. Yeah, Dr. Hugo Strange. Are you going to do? I mean, I let them know I knew, you see. You were throwing up your, your bona fides. Exactly. There, right I was letting there. my fanboy flag fly. fly. And the one of the reasons I wanted to do it was because it was a dream come true for me. Because when I saw the Superman cartoons, I went, wow, what if they ever did Batman like that? Back in college when I first saw them. Let's you know, stop for one sec to go back to, because we rolled over the tre- the treasury thing. And, and this is important because it's all about you eventually being the Joker. How do you go from being a Superman guy to a Batman guy? You were saying it was in the treasury edition. Well, yes. Well, what happened was Superman, even for me, became sort of formulaic. And they were lighthearted. And the first time someone said, hey, you got to read this. And I read... Uh, uh, like I say, it was one of those oversized issues where clearly I was reading Dick Sprang giant props joker on typewriter keys oh yes. oversized typewriters and, yes, and plus he was just clowns I mean this so who how brilliant is a scary clown you know for most people they're not that funny 
Uh, and, Every clown is as, crying right well, now. Well, especially, no, but when you get up close, I remember I'd never been to the circus. When I went to the circus, where you got close enough where you could see the crow's feet under the white makeup. So, I mean, every it's just brilliant. You know, only, uh, I think he might be the, you just the ultimate villain in pop culture because he compliments Batman so perfectly. Batman is so dark and brooding. Joker is so colorful and Flamboyant theatrical. And, and oh, of course, they and you know it took five years for Lex Luthor to show up. And uh, no, no, I'm getting that wrong. I think I read that it was Moriarty. I mean, Sherlock Holmes had all these adventures, and five years into his adventures, they said he we finally could, had an art. Yeah, film. yeah. Ra's al Ghul is the closest to and Denny O'Neill coming up with that. Uh, and I got to tell you, when I wrote Son of the Demon introduction, I had to go and sit in Denny's office and let Denny read what I wrote. And it was, oh, like going to the principal's office at school because <laughs> he didn't smile that much. And I was already a geek where I go, Denny O'Neill. Yeah. Oh, my God. He does all, you know, Neil Adams. And oh, my God, it's Denny O'Neill. That came out of the fact that when I was doing Broadway, I said, you know, I never wrote a letter that got published and I never got to visit the DC offices. Right. Let's use my celebrity with something that I enjoy. So we somehow got in touch with the DC people and said that Mark would really love to come by the office. And what it, year is this? This would have been, let's see, it was when I did uh, Elephant Man or. So you were on Broadway? Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, we had our apartment. So it was probably the. 81, 82. Yeah, yeah, in the early 80s. And. Uh, uh, I went there, and of course, you know, they had posters for me to sign. We did, you the know, swap. yes, and they let me take, you know, I love the rarities like uh, the little comics you got in uh, as giveaways, you know, in cereal boxes right. and stuff. And I got to go into their archives and I got to meet people. And that's how it came to be that Denny eventually, I got on the comp list for, for uh, DC, and uh, they asked for, you know, their favor, which was you write an introduction to Son of the Demon, which was great because I really, I, I had sort of left comics. I wasn't really reading them at that time. And so they gave me a stack of Xerox Racha Ghoul stories. And I thought, this guy, what a great villain intellectually, physically, because, I mean, even Joker, he can duke it out with Batman, but he's clearly outmatched. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, forget about Penguin. You could probably push him and he'll fall over. <laughs> right. He's such a... Uh, roly poly character, but uh, uh, that was my first encounter with DC. And oh, how I agonized over it. I can write, but I'm not a natural writer. I agonize over everything and I change it so much. And, and uh, uh, um, again, I remember the opening. I said, prepare yourself. See, you just need one hook to say, to establish a premise and then what do you write about, you know? So that was good. And uh, meeting all my heroes was good. Um, when you left, did you ever talk? I mean, this, so if it's early 80s, it never occurs to you to be like, hey, can I write here? Can I get a job here? No, it never occurred to me. Because separ- they kept it very separated. Like in, when, I, when we did Clerks, I used it and that and Mall Rats particularly as a bridge into all the shit that I love. Right. Like comic books. Right, right. So for me, once I got, I got to tour DC at yeah. one point. Did you write in the green? Uh, before that, uh, this is when I was like working on the Superman movie at Warner Brothers. Oh, I said, right. I, first off, I was like, why don't you guys we just want hire a spider, a sp- giant spider in act two? Yeah, that's the one. That's famous. Said, why don't you guys just hired a cat that write Superman. Like they do this yeah. every yeah. month, man. They're like, well, we don't work that way. And they're like, do you want to go meet them? I said, yeah, I want to go tour DC and whatnot. So I got to kind of go in there. And while I was there talking about Superman, I saw the Darren Vigenzo's office, and he right. was the Green Arrow editor at the time. I put my head in, and I was just like, hey, man, I know the book's like number 100 or 100, and it's out of the top 100. If you ever want to pop Green Arrow into the top 10, I think we can do it, man. I think I have a way to do it. And he looked at me like, who is this asshole? Right, right. And then years later, I guess, after he'd seen a movie or two, he remembered, and he, he called me up. But I used it as a way to get into I used film or yeah. uh, clerks as a way to get into the shit that yeah. I loved. But at that point in the 80s, people, you were like, I'm an actor. I don't write comic books. You yeah, love yeah. comic books. But imagine if there had been the fluidity now there is between yeah, the arts. You no great. doubt would have been like, can would've I write great. for a long time? Well, going back to that first episode of Batman, I peppered them with all these questions because my aim at that time Mm -hmm. was to come back and do a villain that had never been done before, not on the TV show, not in any of the movies. I was, I leaned towards Scarecrow or Clayface. I thought Clayface might be fun because he's a shapeshifter. Um, I, had I done Trickster yet? 
Because yes. people say you did Trickster in 1990. Okay, and I always thought as a, just an outsider right. fan. That's that, how I got the uh, gig. That somebody was like, and now you know, Trickster, having been in the Joker. business, the TV department doesn't know what the movie department no. does, and the movie department doesn't know what the recording uh, side of Warner Brothers does. So no, it had nothing to do with that. I, I wanted to get a. I went and I thought to pitch to Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo mm-hmm. my take on villains for The Flash because we watched it when Nathan was small and he gave up after about six weeks and said, Nathan, Flash is on. He goes, oh, that's okay. You're not going to watch it. And I later say, why didn't you want to come and watch The Flash? He goes, well, I don't know. He's always fighting like motorcycle thugs so and bad gangsters. What are they going to do? Run. Yeah. So you realize why heroes need super villains even if they're not super powered if they have super big ideas they've got to be larger than life like i say so they invited me in and mary lou was reminding us she goes you remember you thought you were going in to get a writing gig or at least be a story guy to pitch story on the flash tv on the flash tv show and they said what would you think if we said we are going to do a a villain super uh costume villain the first one because they were avoiding it like the plague they didn't want to be camp in any way they didn't even want to do the the flash suit if they could have gotten away yes exactly and uh you know they made it maroon instead of that bright uh, primary red but I hit it off with both those guys immediately, just like you and me. I mean, you speak the common language. Mm. And when they said, you know, if you want, you could be the trickster. I said, you're kidding. I mean, no, I'll just, just do it. And then we started going on about the trickster. You know, we talked about, uh, there was one idea that I thought was brilliant. I think they might've used it somewhere down the road where he was a disgruntled special effects guy from the movies, had all these tricks and, you know, stunts and mirrors and things he could use. And he was caused some accident where someone was injured and he was fired and he was bitter. You know, right. I thought that was a great Secret way to origin, go. man. Yeah, exactly. It didn't come uh, uh, off quite that way, but like I say, well, I, I just had a blast doing it. It was supposed to be a one-off, and then they brought me towards the end of the season. They did a second part where they put the two together for you know directed video movie over in Europe. And if they had been picked up, it was a really shame. They said if we get picked up, we're going to do a two-hour movie, which is a team up between you, Mirror Master, Captain Cold, and uh, uh, the, what's the the boomerang guy? Captain Boomerang. Yeah, Captain Boomerang. Oh my lord! Because I thought one thing I remember about the Flash as a kid, they were big on multiple villains on the same cover. Right. Five, six. If they couldn't get you with the Scarlet Speedster, like, look at all yeah, these yeah, villains. Yeah. Oh, that or a giant gorilla. <laughs> they love gorillas. Gorillas playing baseball. Right. You know, gorillas in a Superman suit. <laughs> you know, they saw their their sales would go up eleven percent if they just put any kind of monkey on the cover. <laughs> Uh, my theory is it's because uh, King Kong was released to television and became uh, the the tragic movie for young boys, the equivalent of what what Gone with the Wind is for girls, King Kong is to boys because it made me cry every time, and I love that monkey so much and <laughs> no don't go to manhattan no leave him on the island yeah just because he's where do you fall different. yes genius yeah. where do you fall in on uh, mighty joe young then is he a, a kmart version of king kong well what i liked is how advanced they were in just you know because that's where rary carry really cut his teeth he was doing more than willis o'brien and they developed a fabric that you know that ripple effect on king kong because whenever they'd move the model they'd leave a little imprint of their thumb, on his fur because yeah, yeah. it was like from a fur coat but cut down small um so by the time they got to mighty joe young it was like this wiry uh, fabric that wouldn't you know i i i love the technical quality and and the reason it's easier to it's more palatable is it's it's it doesn't kill you tragically it's not that horrible thing where they shoot him down right right, right. you know he ends happily and so that's that's much better for it is for it's folks. kind of like the king kong that ends on a happy note exactly so going back to the the to finally get the story out about the joker is once they realize i don't think they would have thought of me because if of the I, trickster no. They wouldn't have put two and two together. No, like, not oh. at all. No, not unless I came in and they sh- were sort of taken aback at how much I knew about it, how much I cared about it. Right. Because uh, I was really forthcoming. I said, why didn't I get to read for the uh, Mr. Freeze? You know, they said, oh, well, you know, we didn't find out you were interested until we already had cast Michael and so forth. So I said, oh, whatever, but I just can't wait and blah, blah, blah. And are you going to use Danny Elfman's music? I mean, I had lots of questions. So anyway, months go by. And I get a call saying, would you be interested? The Batman people called. I said, oh, 
am I coming back? Because Ferris Boyle wasn't killed. They said, no, they want to know if you'll audition for the Joker. And I said, again, because remember, I had just given the role. And uh, people should realize, I should tell you right now, if you offer us a part, we'll take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, the greatest dream in the world is not to have to audition. But this one was too big a challenge. Because on the one hand, damn right I want to go back and audition for the Joker. On the other hand, he's just a little too high profile. Because there's no way I'm going to be able to come up with something that will satisfy people that have heard him in his head all their lives. And or at that point, too, you're competing with the Nicholson Joker. Oh, and I never. I, and it was huge as much know. as like people, you know, now yeah. are like, oh, the Heath Ledger Joker in 1989. Jack Nicholson playing the Joker was 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 massive, almost a mountain you couldn't get over. And somehow you found a way to redefine the character and and become the prominent voice. The well, one that it's interesting used. you should say that because when we went in to actually do it, to audition, there was a couple of sheets of written dialogue. There was that uh, Xerox of that first pose I'd seen when I did Heart of Ice, not in color anymore, black and white. And it said three words, don't think Nicholson, right at the top of the page. So they told you right at the jump. Because, you know, who can out Jack Jack? Right. And now that's not the approach. One of the things that's so great about Nicholson's Joker is he exudes that sly malevolence that is embodied so much of his career. Yeah. Just being there in that makeup you don't really have to do anything. Yeah, he doesn't have to I say I don't even word. remember him having a high pitched laugh or anything. I think he had a really gusty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more like kind of thing. Laugh. And one he of does the, a hoo hoo. He goes hoo 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 hoo. Who he does? He goes. Well, that's hoo-hoo. good because in the comics it was always hoo hoo ha ha. Yes. Yeah, there was so much, and that's another thing that gave me an idea. I said it's almost like a musical instrument. I don't want to do just one laugh. Right. I want to give him colors so that depending on his mood. It can be, a <laughs> it could be wild. It could be with abandon. It could be truly full of uh, of glee, or it could be one of those really ghoulish, mirthless laughs where his eyes are dead. He's like Mitt Romney. If you cover up Mitt Romney's <laughs> mouth, yes. and when he's chuckling, <laughs> when he's rem- saying, "I don't remember holding down a gay kid and cutting his hair off," <laughs> well, I certainly <laughs> don't remember that. I just—it's like O.J. Simpson. It's listen to what Mitt Romney giggles at. It's always things where he's uncomfortable. He doesn't want to talk about it. I really want to learn it because it's it, it, it's so creepy. You know, the she's the right height, and you know, I really love Michigan because of my background, because of playing Luke. There's no way I'm going to get this part. It's just an exercise. Uh, normally, I don't have nerves because I want it. With this one, I was so sure there was no way I could get it. My attitude was like, it's too bad you can't hire me because I'm one hell of a joker. Right. And then I read the script. And I had done Amadeus now for about nine months. I did it the first national tour, and then they transferred me to Broadway. And when you get into an eight-a-week eight, eight uh, schedule, you have to keep it alive or you go to turn into Mr. Machine. You just get mechanical. Right. I came out of the stage door one time, and this girl was in tears saying that's the most moving play I've ever seen. Will you sign my and sign it? And, and the cab going home, I thought, what did I do tonight? Because that girl, it's clearly, I was taken aback because I got into the r- r- route thing and I couldn't remember a single thing I'd done. And that's really a, a wake up call because I said, I've turned into Mr. Machine. I can mechanic, it's in my DNA now. I can just do it. Right. But the part of the tragedy of, of Mozart was how he wasted away at such a young age and he was destitute and, you know, on laudanum and he was just a mess at the end. And if you don't have any sympathy for yourself, the audience will provide it for you. One of the things I did to keep myself interested in Amadeus was working on the laugh. I said, I'm going to try something different tonight because all it had to be is something that shocked the court of Vienna right? because he wrote this uh, heavenly music and then it was described as sort of like a donkey's bray. And since Sir Peter Hall mounted the first natural production, National, Peter Schaffer, the playwright, was there. 
And I really took advantage of that. We had lunch together. He's so much fun to be around. And I asked him about Death Trap and all of his writings and so forth. And I, I said, why did they cut this? You know, because in my audition piece, I criticize uh, Salieri. And I said, do you like my sonnet? Said, yes, except for the fact that it's musical piss. I said, <laughs> I missed that line because it's such a shocking thing to say, musical piss. And he said, the reason he wrote the fact that, I said, do I have to do the laugh like Simon Callow or like Tim Curry? Because I, I only saw Tim Curry. Simon did it originally in London. And then Wait, who, who was the first one? Simon Callow. Okay, I don't know who that is. Well, I am DBM. He's a great character actor, and he directs now, and he's also been in a couple of landmark movies that, of course, escape me at the moment. And he was the first. Yes, Amadeus. when, when, when uh, Paul Schofield did it. Now, Paul Schofield was very Paul aged. Paul Schofield played Salieri originally. You're shitting no. Me. And he was already in his 70s. So when they wanted to go to the West End or they wanted to go to Broadway, he was getting on in his years and didn't think he could really do it. And that's when they got to Ian McKellen. Now, I saw Ian McKellen and, P, uh, and uh, Tim do it on, in New York. Tim Curry. Tim Curry. Now, I had seen Tim when I was doing Texas Wheelers. The guy that created Texas Wheelers said, you've got to go see this play at the Roxy. And I said, I don't like that David Bowie cross-dressing it's just not my thing. He said, no, if you like comedy, forget the, you know, the boys will be girls and girls will be boys aspect. So I showed up at a David Bowie con, con, uh, concert one time at the Palladium, and I thought, I'm really old. I'm, not, I'm the only one here without eyeshadow right. and glitter and stuff because I just liked his music. He said, you've got to go see this guy. Who? Tim Curry plays his character, Frankenfurter. I'm telling you, you like comedy. I'm telling you, you will laugh. I said, that's good enough for me. I got two tickets to see a uh, 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 Rocky Horror Show. And I'm this telling before you. before the movie. There's a lot. Oh, show. and the movie doesn't do him justice. I said, shoot him in long shot. Because he would come into these skidding stops on those high heels. He was like a cartoon character. And he'd zip. You know, and the rubber body and putting on his, he'd do these over the top speeches and put on the rubber gloves and the fingers would be all wrong. And he'd <laughs> snap it, you know, like he was like Joan Crawford on speed or something. He was like just this diva, mean bitch. And he was hilarious. That control, the comedic sense in his body which really carries over because I am such a fan of his work. And the only reason I got the gig is because they changed their mind about the jo approach to Joker. Now, I never told this story, but it's out in the atmosphere now. And the only reason I address it is because I tell uh, voiceover people, in this as part of the business, the easiest thing to change, you can't go and change a performance on live action. You're stuck with it. You can cut around it. You can dub it. You can try and fix it the best way you can. In animation, if things aren't working, they can take, do you know that John Lithgow recorded the entire uh, movie of Hercules and was replaced by James Woods? Get out of he here did playing the, that character. He did the whole movie. I know, uh, what's his name? Finding Nemo, it's Albert Brooks, but Bill Macy recorded the entire movie. It was Bill Macy for the longest time, and then they decided to swap him out they with just, Brooks, and they said, look, Bill Macy's an amazing oh, actor, and he, we loved him because of Fargo, and we still love him to this day, but like... We've tried it, and for some reason it just didn't work. We're going to go with this guy, and then boom, he becomes that guy. So you shouldn't fault yourself. I mean, obviously, Tim Curry is a fantastically talented actor, and I loved his Joker. I had to replace like the first seven episodes, six, I forget how many. The first one I think I remember dubbing was Joker's Favor because there was a tugboat with a garbage scow. And one thing I thought was that fight is so brutal for children's TV. He's taking a crowbar and hitting the guy in the back of the skull. But it was a robot. They right. said that's why we made it a robot because we could get away with things that we couldn't do if we were uh, human fighting humans. And um, it was tough because, I yeah, Joker's Favor was... Uh, one, that's with the Ed Begley. No, wait a minute, that couldn't have been because that was the first Harley Quinn. I remember re reading that script and thinking, because it was like hench wench number one. She didn't even have the name. Right. She was just a sidekick. I think Paul said that. He's like the first time she was in. Which yeah, was yeah. And I'm thinking, background. well, this is funny. What could I, I have a girlfriend? Because his ego is so great that, I, you, you know, you think women aren't even on the... On his radar at exactly. all. He's asexual. He's Espe like Morrissey. Especially when the comics were directed at a younger age. Now, we're in an era where, you know, they could bring him back in Dark Knight, and he's like some washed-out rock star, and right. Faye, and all this stuff. I mean, the interpretation, that's why I liked Heath Ledger so much. I said, oh, it's a completely 
mirthless, no joy whatsoever in being a clown. Right. It's almost like a heroin addict. And it's so tongue-centric, like Hannibal Lecter, it's creepy. Mm. I loved it, yeah. but I never thought of it that way. I even thought with Jack Nicholson, I said, I, I wish we could preserve that performance, but give him the makeup that Conrad Veet had in The Man Who Laughs. Because the prosthetic cheeks, it, I want to see his face. Yeah, yeah. I want to see his face. And if they had just given him the veneer, the teeth, and he's got back the hair. face, and he's got oh, the, mouth, the yeah. smile. And if you look at that still from Conrad Veet uh, about the, the story, is that his face was cut into a smile mm -hmm. at a very early age, and he's got the obviously these false teeth. The, the, it was the model sheet when Jerry Robinson and Bill Finger and Bob Kane were creating, creating the, Joker. the Joker. That, that was like, we one like of, this image. Yeah, that's the image, the playing card, and that image of Conrad Veet in that silent movie. So. So you come in and you're revoicing. Well, I come in to read first of all. Did you know when you came in for uh, Hard Advice that Tim Curry was playing the Joker? They're like Tim Curry. I'm Joker. trying to remember. I think maybe I said, "Who's doing this? Who's doing that?" And they might have mentioned it. It didn't really make an impact on me, or, or I would have remembered specifically. And that sometimes worries me. I know when I was thinking about doing this with you, I remembered seeing the very first time they projected an episode in public, part one of the Two-Faced origin yes. at the Comic-Con. And when they got to the end, and, and it's the first time you see him in the lightning turning around and they reveal for the first time, of course, it had to be a two-parter. Right, right. right. Uh, and you see his face and the crowd just goes apeshit when it says, to be continued. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> and... In my mind's eye, I was there. Now I'm thinking, I think I read about this. Oh, I don't wow. think I actually saw it at San Diego. I heard about it, and I so could imagine it in my head that over the years, all these 20 years later... You've placed yourself into I the think, incident. Yeah, I don't think I was really there. You incepted yourself into uh, that memory. Yes. I mean, you got to be careful about that because, you know, I mean, the, the line between reality and how you remember blurs. But I do remember when I did the audition, like I say, I said, there's no way just from the standpoint of PR that they're going to cast the most virtuous you know, character in fantasy. Uh, let's try to think of a modern day comparison. There's nothing. I, I was going to say, the only comparison you can make is this. It's like casting Luke Skywalker as the Joker. <laughs> so yeah. for you to walk into yeah. that room, they were you were probably, as you said, just like, they're never going to go never. for this. Never, never, never. And what gave me great um, uh, encouragement in myself and the fact that I was really uh, focused was... I had a lifetime of loving this character. I mean, and loving Batman. Believe me, when the, when the TV series came on, I just couldn't get over because I wanted everybody to know Batman. Everybody knew Superman. Everybody knew Superman. It was part of the culture, but not everybody knew Batman. And even though it was sort of corny and, you know. It was he, still legit. It was like, course. this is Batman from comics. And it, it, make, it made him break out into the mainstream like James Bond or anybody else. For that, I'm internally grateful. Plus, I really appreciated the performance of Adam West. It was so sly in its humor and so deadpan. Uh, you know, it got formulaic and I realized, oh, because I mean, I was on the cusp of taking it seriously. The first one with Frank Gorshin just blew my mind. He's still my favorite supervillain ever. Riddler? Riddler. Oh, by, played by Frank Gorshin. By Frank though. Gorshin, yeah. And uh, I didn't have a color TV. It was black and white. And after a couple of months, I go, oh, okay, I can God, move. You make me, now you made me just want to watch a, 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 a Riddler episode. Oh, yeah. The very first one where they, you know, they cut back on budget and so forth. But it's the one with Jill St. John where she gets into the Robin outfit. And, of course, it's really Burt Ward dubbed with her voice. Right. And what's so funny is when she pulls off the mask, <laughs> she's got the... The form of a woman that no, wasn't there Jill before. Jill St. John. Before she was flat-chested uh, uh, Burt Ward. But, um, there is, a, now that I think about it, there's, a, there's also a little bit of Riddler in your, in your cock knocker, if you will, from Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back with the, and now you're going to meet the end of yeah, cock he, knocker. He, he, he would do would, a wind he would play up. With, yes. yes. He would do like... I've been in this town so long I can't even tell you. Because he would do 
because you know perfect. he would do Burt Law, uh, Burt Lancaster, his uh, Kirk Douglas. I mean, he was an impressionist on on uh, uh, Ed Sullivan. So you could see he had the essence of these larger than life movie stars all mushed up into one. And that I tell voiceover people a lot of the times. I said sometimes if you do an impression of somebody and the people don't know you're doing it, like start out with Jackie Gleason. Or I did one time, did one that was Howard Cosell, and nobody knew it. Because they were like, there's no we more. We're using the cadence of him without really doing Cosell. Right. And if you meld it with your own uh, uh, creativity, you come up with a third voice that's not really, it's, it started, the play, clay that you started with was Cosell or Jackie Gleason. Now it's something entirely different. Because like with Joker, I thought, it must be Claude Rains. I loved as a kid listening to the musical quality of voices. I don't drink wine. You know, uh, where did Bella Lugosi come from that he would talk like that? Right. Or Maria Ospenskaya. The way you walked was tarny, through no fault of your own. You go, where's she from? Right. So anyway, I very cockily drive out of the Joker audition thinking, ha, that's the best Joker they'll ever get. You know, too bad they can't hire me. And it was very cocky. And then I've told this before. It's nothing new. But when I got the call, and I say, well, congratulations. I said, for what? Oh, uh, you, uh, they want you for Joker. I said, oh, no. Oh, no. I can't, I can't do this. I don't even remember what I did. <laughs> oh, no. I said, Let, tell them I'd play Clayface or, 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 uh, or, or Scarecrow. I mean, are you sure? Make sure they want me because... I, 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 Were you thinking big shoes at that point because of Nicholson? No, I would. Well, that came. No, I, it was funny because when I had the complete 180 in confidence, it was over the legacy of someone like him. Because I, you know, I liked Cesar Romero. I thought he was great energy. I sort of miffed that he wouldn't shave his mustache for the part. He didn't care enough to shave <laughs> to his mustache. Distance. Yeah, and of course. I, uh, an actor friend of mine, he goes, well, I thought you were brave going out for it in the first place. I said, why? He goes, I wouldn't want to follow Jack Nicholson in anything. I went, oh, no, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. But, I mean, they did say don't think Jack Nicholson, and I didn't do Jack. Uh, I didn't realize. Of course, they have reference tape when you say, I can't remember what I did. They're going to play you what you did. And I, I think it was put up or shut up. I mean, when I didn't think I could get it, I thought, I'll, I'll, I have nothing to lose. Yeah, and I'll give them. I will empty. They're going to really rue the day that they didn't hire me. And then when they hired me, I just went into a tailspin of like, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and what was nice, I went to sort of like boot camp because when I first came in to do it, I had to dub all the ones that they'd done previously, which is so you hard. got to hear the Tim Curry. He was wonderful, but he was very similar to what he did as Captain Hook. Well, boys, soon all of Gotham will be mine. Now, he what was, was the Captain Hook? Well, he did. Well, he there were sixty five episodes of a show called Peter Pan and the Pirates on Fox, and it was well. It started a year before us. So at that point, they were like, "Hey, they'd Tim heard Curry's him as popular as, right now. He, he was, does a good villain." Yeah, and what I'm saying, it was so similar to Captain Hook, and the Fox executives had heard it so many times, and like I, you know, no, you read that little quote in the book because i i've forgotten they what paul dini the said about book, it yeah. that they thought they'd lack some of the i forget the chaotic or whatever um andrea later said to me oh it was your laugh that's dead bang what you got you the part and like i say i'd worked out so many different kinds of laughs as um, as mozart one night i'm going to try and do this and i'm going to try and be do a little Oliver Hardy. I mean, I love to do uh, try out as long as it was something that was startlingly wrong. Right. Uh, I could get away with sometimes the stage manager said, you're going into the woods, you get back to the higher <laughs> pitch, you know, cause some of the other actors have said, why is he changing it? Uh, I said, to stay awake, you know, right. Um, they asked Jackie Gleason, when did he get bored doing Take Me Along? He said, about 20 minutes into act two. He thought <laughs> he's going to say, you know, in the third or fourth month. You right. Know? <laughs> but that's Jackie Gleason. So anyway, I mean, I got, went in and I was lucky because I was able to do, technically it was just me, just doing the ADR beeps and I'm technically proficient. What was hard is like getting the cadence because it's already animated. Right. I had so many lip flaps to do the line. You have to 
match the performance on screen at that point. You can't pretty much. I mean, well, ramp you could, up, you could change you it as long as the rhythms were the same. And the, you know, he had emphasis that was sometimes different because you know English people come from a different idiom than us. Mm-hmm. Um, I could probably even think of examples if I had the time. But my point is, once I got to the point where the, my very first one with the whole cast, where you go in and they're going to record from start to finish an episode. Is that how they do it? Yeah. Like you guys are all in the like same room. Like a radio room, Just show. like The Simpsons, yes, they do exactly. it that way. And they're separators, you know, like in a rock album, you know, so we don't bleed into other people's mics. Now, right. I had to stand up in the beginning. I can now do Joker sitting down, but in the beginning, I had to be able to shake my fists and pull my hair, and I couldn't imagine energizing him in a seated position. But... Uh, we would do one read through. It was two to six all the time. You come in at two, you do a, what they call a table read, even though you're all sitting at your music stands, and you take cuts, you ca- take some changes, uh, you ask your questions, uh, you know, can I change that to this? Or uh, one thing I do is read your change in, don't ask to do it, because if they think about it, they'll say no. Right. If you yeah. read it in, they kind of like it. Oh, and they're yeah. like, oh, it's a surprise. Yeah, I like that, that, yeah, that's good. That's good. You can keep that. Uh, but then we'd break it around 10 to three. We'd have like 15 minutes and people would go, you know, have coffee or smoke or whatever. And then we come back in. I'm telling you, we'd read it from start to finish and we never were over. It was never 601 because you'd have to get a bump. Right. It was that well done. And I was spoiled because I thought everything's this well written, well organized, well directed, Shirley Walker's music. The uh, just the you know the fact that they had an orchestral score, all of it, and I soon learned okay you know because I've been in the trenches of animation for twenty years now, but uh, uh, I I started out with um, the best and my favorite. Um, it was really sad because we you know I didn't work consistently. Joker's only in twenty percent of the episodes, but is that right? Something like that. I mean, he's, he's done. I, it's one of those things where he's a real interesting ingredient in your stew. But if you do it too much, you get tired of him. That's what I loved about the variety of the shows. Because even within the Joker shows, you know, Harley and Ivy, that's a comedy. That's Thelma and Louise where Joker's in an apron and totally Mm -hmm. cuckolded. And he's, I understood what I was supposed to be in that uh, episode. A couple of times I got a little covetous of my role and thinking my dignity was ruffled when I get bonked on the head and they'd animate me going and you'd be like hey that ain't the character yeah show him a little and again I mean I had to realize uh when we did Mask of the Phantasm or uh, Return of the Joker oh for Batman. Oh, God, that's right. Mask of the Phantasm went to theaters. Yeah. And, you know, the problem was they didn't make that decision until about Last three minute. months into it. Yeah. And so they would already were animating. They had to change midstream because the executive said, this could be in the theaters. A funny story. It opened on Christmas Day in 93, 94. I was at the theater. Whatever it was, I went... On the east side of New York, I was living in 87 in Central Park West. I took my whole family on Christmas night. We get there, and there was my family and maybe five or six other people to the point where everybody in the theater recognized me. <laughs> and I said, well, don't be a stranger. Come on. They all sat with us. It, I was shocked. I don't, it, it did not do well in the theaters, but it did gangbusters when it went to home video. Totally. But it was also like what's relevant about that is they don't do that anymore. There's never some modern day cartoon where they're like, hey, let's do a feature version in theaters. They'll do right. a straight to DVD feature, yeah. or an iTunes feature, or something like that. Well, but. but you know, for what it was, we went from a 30 piece orchestra to a 100 piece orchestra, and they were able to like do his origin of the Joker. Mm-hmm. It's as close as the killing joke I ever got. Mm-hmm. And it was, and what I'm saying. Well, that's, uh, the game's not over yet, though. Well, the focus wasn't Joker per se. I mean, right. it was the ma- Phantasm and all that. They had just room to stretch, and because there wasn't standards and practices there, there was uh, there there was a lethal quality. I killed more intensity. I think I killed uh, Abe Vigoda's uh, pl- gangster. So yeah, again, you could do things that you couldn't get away with in the movies, which is great. Now d- DVD, directed DVD, Warner Brothers releases are really scratching an itch that the f- fans have wanted for years because they don't have to deal with it being a children's Standards cartoon. Standards and practices, right? So they have some really adult stuff. Under the Red Hood it was fantastic with John DiMaggio as the Joker and Bruce. Uh, is it Bruce Campbell? No, not Bruce Campbell. It's uh, Bruce, yeah, the actor um, who was in the recent Star Trek reboot. And he he also Kennedy. played RFK in that crisis, JFK, miss, I, missile crisis movie with uh, Kevin Costner. Yeah, yeah. Greenwood? Bruce Greenwood. Is that his yeah, name? I can't remember. But, well, uh, you know, anyway, you know. He, the, played, he did Batman once. Right, exactly. What is that like when 
someone else does the Joker. No, I mean, well, now, of course, you have to get used to it. But, like, there must have been a moment where you were just like, what the, what, what? Well, no, what happens is uh, um, the first one I saw was The Batman. The Batman. That's where Kevin Michael Richardson does it. Sort of is like this. Who's an awesome guy. Oh, such and he's a sweetheart. such a great actor. And he's an, as an actor, if you ever want to see Kevin Michael, you've heard his work forever. You've yeah. heard him in uh, Lilo Cle- and Stitch. Cleveland show. He's phenomenal. Yeah. But if you want to see him, he's in Clerks 2. He's the cop that comes in during the That's donkey show right. scene. That's right. Okay, yeah. Because he was our voice on the Clerks cartoon. Yeah, he was our exactly. narrator. And well, he voices. can do anything. I hired oh, he's him. So he's good. in comic book, the movie. I love him to death. But we have this joke because when he was giving an interview about who his favorite Joker was, he goes, I have to give props to Jack Nicholson. So the next time I saw him, I said, you SOB, what about me? <laughs> right. And so my joke to him is because he got nominated for an Emmy. And I never got nominated for an Emmy. As the Joker? As the Joker. You're kidding. So I said, you know, I said, I'm very happy for Kevin getting a, an Emmy nomination, especially when his performance as the Joker is such a sad copy of my <laughs> voice. I mean, he really, what he's doing is he's imitating me quite openly and slavishly. I, I hesitate to report. So it's a joke, right. really, because I love Kevin. He's incredibly talented. But I just thought it was so funny because I said, God damn it, if you got an Emmy nomination, why didn't I get yeah. any Emmy love? I mean, I didn't, uh, even if I didn't win, I, I want to get a nomination. The timing. And I didn't really get why did they do the Batman? What was it about the Batman? What was the reason to be? Because with Brave and the Bold, you go, oh, they're going to the 60s team-up look. Right. And they're unapologetically camp, and they do it with such conviction. They show you how to do camp. Nice work, old chum. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's so committed to it. Uh, Daedric Bader is Batman. And I went back. We did some stuff. You were stu- you, uh, co-star in Jane Silent Pop Strike Back. He was the security guard. That's like, right. You don't have a pass. Oh, that's right. And you know what's so funny is they did stunt casting. They did this thing called, um, what was it called? Uh, I forget the title, but it was the, it was the Brave and the Bold where they did the story of how uh, Bruce Wayne's parents were killed. Okay. And for stunt casting, as Thomas Wayne, Adam West, okay. as Martha Wayne, Julie Newmar, that's awesome. As Phantom Stranger. Kevin Conroy, and as the specter, Mark Hamill. Oh, my Lord. So it was all of us in that room. I tell you, the only time before I'd ever done Joker where Adam was there, we did, we got a waiver from SAG because we were doing, it was a student animation. Uh, their their, their uh, final project was this Lego Batman. When we saw it, it blew our minds because we thought we had no idea it was going to be that good. Right. With swooping, you know, they swoop in on a terrace cocktail party. And I mean, we were stunned. They got uh, Dick Van Dyke played Commissioner Gordon. I did Joker. And instead of, I don't know why, because usually I'm, it's like Laurel and Hardy, me and Kevin, Kevin right. and me. But I went in and they're sitting down with this Hawaiian shirt on. Uh, Mark, it's nice to meet you. It's, my Adam, it's my Batman. childhood Batman. Adam West. No, my Batman now, of course, is Kevin. But I just, I told him, I said, you know, it was such a big deal when that show came on TV. And I so wanted it to be popular. I so wanted it to be a hit because everything I liked got, got canceled. You're talking to the only person I know who actually cried real tears when they canceled Car 54, Where Are You? <laughs> I just would read in the newspaper, it's not coming. Yeah, but why? And the was fuck? the cry like, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm sad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm very sad. Oh, Francis, I'm, I'm so upset. Uh, How was it doing Joker opposite? Intimidating. Was Although, because, I mean, he was in my peripheral vision, and he was, like, looking at me when I'm doing it. But when we took a break, he was, why, Mark, that's quite a remarkable Joker. Great energy. Whatever he said was just... <laughs> uh, I was geeking out. But, uh, and he's such a hell of a nice guy. That's, uh, one of my favorite episodes is Beware the Grey Ghost, whatever yes. that Grey Ghost story it is. It was Bruce Wayne's childhood hero. Yes, and how he got ideas to... I love that kind of retro stuff. And, you know, when you, like I say, when you're coming up with eventually 109 episodes, you got to go to a lot of different... What the run was 109. Eventually, and when they did the Adventures of Batman and Robin, our original was 65. 
then they got picked up and it was like the adventures of Batman, Batman and Robin. And, Robin. Yeah. and then there are the Batman Superman adventures. That's when we did the team up world's finest and we did Joker's millions, which is based on an actual comic book story. And none of them are my favorite because there are very few that are actually based on comic book stories, but uh, the laughing the fish, laughing fish is one of Steve them. Yeah. And they did that in the first season. If I remember, correctly. it was early on. And I remember that one, um, Bruce was not as happy with it as he could have been because I loved it. And when I saw it and told him about it, he said, yeah, but they didn't animate it. They wanted to make that as scary as they could. You know how they made up? If you watch it again, Shirley Walker's music, they said, score it like a horror film because we're the, the, it doesn't have the impact that it had in the storyboards. And when we come back from the animation, they were a little, so they tried to make up with it, with the music, mm. but uh, it's such a novel idea. And I love the fact, cause I mean, I have fans all the time say, why well, don't they get the guys that write the animated series, write the movies. Yeah. When we saw Batman and Robin, I wanted to go and strangle someone. It was so bad. And you're, Mr. Freeze was a million times more effective than I to see you. When I got the Superman job years ago, that was one of the first things I said. I was just like, um, not for nothing. They're like, what do you, you, you seem to know a bit about Superman because I talked about him in Mall Rats. The Mall right, Rats jokes. Right, right, yeah. So like, you seem to know a bunch about Superman. I was like, I mean, I know as much as a guy reads comics. I said, but if you guys are redoing Superman, why don't you hire anyone from over there man like over at dc these cats turn yeah. out fantastic stories yeah. hire frank miller hire any yeah. one of these cats you know, they hired the guy who wrote lethal weapon three and they give him an anthology the best of superman from the 30s to the 70s he reads it over a weekend and then comes and pitches the next week Pretty that's much. just the way this business works it's a shame it's but changing though now we, they try to put yeah. more fans in yeah the exactly the marvel movies stuff. have reflected that and you know the uh the truth of the matter is with paul dini and the, the people that they hired on our our show uh see a lot of those other guys think comics are beneath them right uh, you need somebody that really appreciates their why they've had such a shelf life why there's such longevity in that form of storytelling to really or someone that plays it straight like they don't go oh it's kids it's stuff. for or, kids uh, like yeah that's when dini was on the last episode he starts when he starts talking about that episode heart of ice and he ch ch choked up and you you sit there and you go like that's that's what i'm talking about like the kind that you don't get a beautiful story like heart of ice without a guy that's not like he couldn't get through telling the story without being like there's real pain behind it i know and that's what was extraordinary about that show it looked amazing visual it, it's something that fires on all cylinders he you know what it reminds me of the, a, a recent comparison would be the iron man movie the first one. Oh yeah i thought it fired on every fucking cylinder everybody was at 100 percent, and because of it the whole is amazing right really stand out the animated series, everyone was firing on 100%. Nobody was treating it like a fucking day job. Nobody was treating it right. like it was a kid's show. Yeah. They were like, look, kids can appreciate it, and you know, we'll work with standards and practices to make sure we don't alienate or frighten right. kids. But we're going to make sure that whoever watches this is going to be really, really entertained, and that includes a lot of adults. Like me, I was, I was growing up at that point. When it started airing in 1992, I was... 22 years old, I already had the idea that I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I hadn't made a film yet. And right. I would sit a quick stop, go next door to RST, oh, I heard that story, get a VCR. and record yeah. them, man. I well, love give them you, so you, there's much. a good example. Uh, usually you only tape episodes that you're in. Th that not true. I did, taped every episode because every everyone was so fantastic. I mean, even shows that get con I know the first one I saw was the, the bat, uh, uh, man bat. Mm. episode yeah and people criticize that episode but in on terms leather of, wings I believe on leather wings yeah but just the way they animated it and the the approach was dead on it might not have been their favorite episode but you knew they were headed in the right direction yeah and like people will say you know i went online to to prepare a little bit today because my memory's foggy you know i didn't have time to really go back and look at a lot of the episodes and they'll be the top 10 the worst 10 you know all the different fans and stuff and I noticed, like, even on an episode that's not highly uh, regarded, I mean, there's different Like, levels. I've got Batman in my basement. Yeah, but for me, one of the ones that they never talk about was Be a Clown, where I... Originally, I kidnapped the mayor's son. Right. Standards and practices made us change it to where he stows away in the back of my truck because I'm posing as a child's birthday party clown. Right. And the reason that was a challenge to me, they said... The Joker's in makeup as another clown. So what we want you to do is you come up with a voice that 
when Bruce Wayne comes and you say something and then laugh, that's what tips him off. Right. That laugh. So, but you got to come up with it. See, now that's the challenge. How do you work backwards to put on a persona that is going to fool everybody? And what direction do I go? And I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know what to do. And then I thought, uh, I think uh, Babes in Toyland was on the Disney Channel. And what? Ed Wynn. <laughs> he's a, he, you know, he's a kind of a crazy clown. He had that again. I'm doing a bad impression. Or, but that's the foundation on which I build. I'm Jekko. Right. Pleased to meet you. I did lots of wet essays and stuff. And it was very sort of, because you don't want anybody to know you're the Joker. Right. That was the fun of Son of the Joker, where Joker returns. Uh, Andrea said, we're not going to do any of your Joker here. None of that. You had to keep it very close to the vest. Make it like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Because we want the audience to say, is it a clone? Is it a robot? Is it like a, a, a dream? It's not him. It can't be Yeah, him. it can't be because he's young and Bruce Wayne's 85 years old. So, boy, she took away all my binkies and my blankets and my security. Because usually you get behind the wheel of that crazy car and it's like oh it's like going back to an old friend okay. it's just great back to get back into his head because vicariously i can be as arrogant and as on top of the world as he is he enjoys life so much i mean he's not going to just rob a bank he's got to make performance art out of it give clues have a theme you know most criminals don't go to the length to, as jerry right. seinfeld <laughs> point out to actually come up with a theme for their careers right. you know? i love that kind of analytical uh, breaking down the comic books for reality you know like what, what's with the uh, uh green lantern i am not big with jewelry on men i mean <laughs> my bread and butter man also, half the work they, i do when is george was saying that. what's the deal on aquaman i mean does he die when he's out of water no i think he's got to be near water or at least take a dip every so often i just love people trying to bring logic to to comic books i mean that's why some of the stuff i love the most is the most reviled of all the eras of comics i mean when they did that batmite episode on uh brave and the bold right do you remember they did parodies of those robert clampett cartoons like yeah. the the great piggy bank robbery hammerhead yeah. you know so and so and all the different people and Paul Rubens, brilliant as he wasn't Pee Wee, he was just an over enthusiastic 10, 10 year old that loved <laughs> Polka Dot Man, which is like a one shot, the worst villain ever. He had polka dots that you pull from his and throw, yeah, like frisbees that would cut you in half or whatever. Uh, but th that's, I think, part of the reason, uh, yeah, everybody wants him revamped into the Dark Knight, but there's something childlike that I never will forget about those stories that you outgrow and look back on. It's that whole Peter Pan syndrome. Right. You can never go home again. And in the days where they wrote for children to outgrow comics, is the window was 6 to 12, and then they don't read comics anymore. That's why they could revamp characters. They said, because we have a whole new generation. Not anymore. It, no, now <laughs> it's across the board. Everybody reads them, and that's just the way it is. I mean, I said to people, if you like a realistic take on Batman... The Christopher Nolan movies are the best you'll ever do. Right. But there, with, with some melancholy on my part, you know, I, I enjoy even the, the, the serials, the ridiculous, fast-paced, crazy serials. I wonder why they didn't do Joker back then. Because it yeah. would have been so easy. In the black to, and white. Yeah, to do, do a, a fright wig. They did the man, as you pointed out, the man who, who laughed. I mean, that was in black and white. That so was clearly, silent. Yeah. That was a silent so clearly movie. clearly they could have done it for the Bob Kane talks about, uh, you know, I'm, I was able to, with, uh, there was a famous dinner where it was uh, Bill Mooney and Miguel Ferrer, who were comic with fans like me. Me, invited uh, Jerry and Joanne Siegel, Jack and Roz Kirby, and Bob and Elizabeth Kane. I'm thinking, holy moly, if in animation terms, it would be like if Walter Lance and Walt Disney and Max Fleischer, uh, you know, uh, and Hanna Barbera all had dinner together. It's a dream dinner, right really there. great. And then Bob on his own uh, asked us to dinner a couple of times, and he was kind of an amazing character. He sort of brought, reminded me of a cross between Bruce Wayne because he had a blue blazer and a white ascot. Right. Who wears ascots? <laughs> And he would brag about having slept with Marilyn Monroe. It was like being back in high school. Did he really? Yeah. And he said, oh, when I would created Catwoman. <laughs> yeah. She was swell in the sack. And you're going, 
I don't know. I kind of remember back in high school, the guys that bragged about it. It was the quiet ones that were getting all the action, right. that were secure in what they were doing, didn't want to get out that they were uh, having it off. And uh, it, it just struck me one time, Bill Mooney is one of the most even-tempered guys you'll ever meet. He, he did uh, an episode of Batman. He was in Batman. Bay way back in the day as a kid. He was in Lost in Space. Yes, and, and he did one of the most famous Twilight Zone, I'm going to send you the cornfield. So he's a also, very didn't pro- didn't he do f- fish heads? Yeah, fish that was his. Heads, yeah, fish, fish heads. Yeah, heads. Uh, Barnes, and Barnes, Barnes, Barnes and Barnes was the group. That's right. He also worked with Alfred Hitchcock. I didn't know that, but he did that episode, that famous episode where the returning war veteran comes home and the little boy goes up into his room and sees his gun. He takes the gun and wanders around the neighborhood and the audience knows it's loaded or there's a couple of bullets in the chamber and the suspense comes. Is he going to kill somebody? Because right. he's five, he's four, he's a little kid. I said to Billy, what was it like working with... Hitchcock, he said, I don't have a lot of memories, but you know, at that age, you have a lot of energy. And I was kind of bouncing around and he turned to me and said, young man, if you continue to behave like that, I shall be forced to nail your feet to the floor. <laughs> and I said, what did you do? He goes, I, I couldn't breathe. I thought I, if I spoke, I'd cry. I mean, it was such a shock for him to say that. And I said, did it work? He said, oh yeah, I didn't move the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah he's in the golden age for me of somebody that's my my uh, age and he did a he was in the terrible trio in the in the batman the you're saying series. he never he's very even tempered but very even tempered but we were at dinner one night and uh, bob was saying uh ha, ha, remember when batman used to kick your ass in the ratings <laughs> lost in space we are and his he's a redhead all the blood drained out of his face. He didn't lose his temper, but very even keeled. Because you tell it really got under his skin. Bob, Lost in Space was on before Batman. And we were still on the air after Batman was canceled. <laughs> now, instead of being sort of taken aback or, oh, excuse me. Right. He's... <laughs> That he was almost Burgess Meredith. He was that penguin penguin laugh he had. And, you know, talk about bravado. And you, it's funny because you read about it later and you read how people like Jerry Robinson drew much better than he did. And he got such a better contract than Jerry Siegel. Jerry Siegel was so unassuming and Jerry Siegel, co creator of of Superman. Of Superman with Joe Schuster and just the sweetest guy in the world. And, you know, uh, you know, he was, you, you go, he's the kind of guy, you, no wonder he got bullied because he asked for they created Superboy which he had pitched to them when he was over in World War II he comes back and they're doing Superboy which they had rejected when he suggested it but they got nothing for Superman and then Bob's father his real name is Khan like Madeline Khan K-A-H-N his father was a lawyer and Bob was only 18 19 right out of high school uh, said, come up with this character who had uh, Birdman, he called him. He had this bit like Michelangelo kite on mm. his back and he was in a red, like the Flash. Right. With a domino mask. And Finger helped him saying, you know, why don't we scallop? First of all, let's make him the colors of, of you know, the night, right. you know. As Because he was Birdman, then he became Batman and they came, you know, so much collaboration. And whereas... um uh, a lot of people are really more than happy to share the the credit. Ba- uh, Bob paid everybody off to to not mention their contribution. In those days, they didn't care. Is that right? So he was like, "Look, I'll give you a little." Well, extra. you're on salary, and even DC didn't know his stuff was being ghosted by Shelley Maldoff and and Jerry Robinson because Jerry Mar- Robinson he met right out of high school in like some art institute, and they came on. So yeah, he would deliver his art, and for the longest time they didn't even know he, he had ghosts. Eventually, Sheldon Maldoff came out of the shadows, and it all came out front because they took uh, Kane off of Batman much earlier than people remember. By the time the TV series series had come he out he hadn't done book. it for years right. but he told that story of coming out to see the see the the serial being made dc was kicking itself because they came to them first and said we want to make a serial out of superman and dc said yeah but we want control we want this we want script approval and they said bye-bye and they went to captain marvel so captain marvel becomes the first superhero on the screen and superman oh you know they follow and then eventually batman uh, uh, bob king comes out and he's visiting the set and he's looking around because they're in a cave set and it's pretty cool and he's really excited he says where's the batmobile they go right there and he looks over and it's just like the producer's car a regular car 
nothing, no bat motif, nothing that would identify it. And he said his heart sank, but he was just so, you know, happy that they were adapting his stuff into the movies that he didn't really say anything. But, uh, yeah, I was always disappointed that uh, Batman did, wasn't on par with Superman. Of course, now that's all changed. Right. But Those uh, serials, yeah, the yeah. serials didn't quite live up to the George Reeves. Oh, not at all. I but mean, then, the, the and, technique of having him run behind a rock and come out as an animated cartoon. Now, with the with the Captain Marvel, that was truly clever because they tilted the camera. They built a, a Captain Marvel in the flying pose, the uh-huh. flat flying pose with the arms outstretched and the legs behind him. And he was made of like, um, uh, almost like a, a light molded plastic or rubber well all i'm saying was two rings on a cable and that's what pulled them to there well they tilted and it was on an angle so they push it and it go downhill right. but with a camera like this it looked like it was going. he's flying through the air the flying effects are much better in uh captain marvel what's startling to modern day eyes is how brutal he is he'll stop a car rip the doors off the car and take gangsters screaming and throw them off a cliff <laughs> it was 1940 you know before they had that sort of uh, yeah we mo- can't kill people yeah they're like batman carrying a gun in the early issues you know they didn't have that code of honor yet right almost got him was our first team up and i like that because i got to work with other villains who by that time i'd come to know and really love like i say richard mole as as two-face and aaron kincaid as killer croc and diane pershing as poison ivy arlene as uh, harley quinn when we came in to do joker's favor and you know we're going along uh boys seal the doors no one's getting out of here alive by the way, Mr. J, she comes out with this. It was like Judy Holiday in Born Yesterday. And you'd never heard it before? I'd never heard it before. I thought I would fall off my chair. We just instantly fell in love with her. Everybody to a person. Now, Deanie said he had known Arlene for many, many years. And he even co- incorporated that song that she does in one of the episodes. In Harlan Quinnage, she does this novelty song you know Mm -hmm. put down the acid and it's a really funny song but you know he wrote it for with her in mind and they'd sometimes come to work together in the same car but we weren't we were unprepared i didn't know arlene she had been on a soap opera and she's a writer and you know how do you do and all that but when we came to her part and that came out of her mouth you just instantly melted and thought uh, first of all, you saw the drawings of what she's going to look. And, you know, they we used to draw those, you know, Poison Ivy and Catwoman and just as the idealized uh, female form. And that's what was so hard about that relationship. First of all, we all loved her. And she eventually came back and she became Harley Quinn. And we're all, I'm vicariously proud that we added to the DC universe. The Batman uh, mythos. She yeah, put a spoke exactly. in the wheel. So she lived on beyond uh, our show. And that really didn't happen. I thought the ventriloquist was ours, but I think he no, was. No, he based, came from the comics. Yeah. Alan Grant, I think. Didn't so uh, that was a thrill, and you know, to, to, again, I mean, it's just such a, a delicious uh, performance. And um, I was a little disappointed because Paul Dini came to me after Mad Love came out as a comic book, and he says, "Do you want to do that as a book on tape?" I said, "I'd love to do that as a book on tape." Now, eventually, they wound up doing it as an episode, right? And they had to clean it up. Yeah, they had to take scale down some. Yeah, of the yeah. Stuff that was if it were a book on tape, it would have been the exact. And issue. it was the revamp Joker too. Like the Joker that was in the book itself was the first Bruce Tim joker incarnation and then the one that you guys did the mad love show for was the yeah. black eyed Bla- and no red lips yes the, i don't mind the eyes shift because they made him look like a shark yes and they had white dots for his pupils but i did miss the delineation on the mouth so you know in a way it's uh, you understand how you have to keep revamping to reinvent yourself the beatles never put out the same album twice mm. but uh and um, i think that in the later incarnations like you said before with penguin like Bruce, they'd had enough juice under them yeah. to like, you know what, I'm going to do them closer to what yeah. I want. So Yeah, exactly, because, you know, we tried to make it more like the Danny DeVito version, mm. but, uh, you know, he was always meant to be very erudite and Monoc- quite learned. And, yeah, and uh, you know, Oswald Cobblepot. And, uh, you know, they got the idea for him from the logo from the Cool Cigarette Pack. Yeah. So, uh, um, and Paul Williams, again, was just effortlessly the voice you wanted to hear coming out of the penguin. Um, 
but uh, there weren't a lot of team ups. I do know we did one. One of the there were several ideas floating around for what's going to be our movie, and one was Trial, where all the villains put Batman on trial. So essentially, that gives you the opportunity to do like, and then this happened, you right? Can do and you have stars. multiple villains that can cross examine them. You know, right. they do it in Almost Got Them. They're playing cards playing and they cards, remember yeah. all that stuff. Um, and, and it buttons with the really nice Catwoman going, almost got him. Like, yeah. And the reveal of Batman in the swinging light. Yes. When, oh, oh, it's so just good. wonderful. It really is. Uh, and, then, and then that beautiful music right under it. Like There's the light reveal. And, I just get, I would get off so much because the boys are now grown for me. But when they were really little, Nathan would have been like. Your kids you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Nathan would have been 12, 13. And Griffin's four years behind. So he would have been nine or something. And they loved it. You know, not just my episodes. It was something we all did together. together. And, uh, and, and you, you, like you say, when it's working on all cylinders, you know, when, when the art direction and the music and the voice casting and the script and, you know, you know they pan up and the rain is coming right in your face. They did wonderful noir. Yeah. Because you can draw anything. You can draw anything. Um, it was a cartoon. I used to watch it quick stop and people would come in. And people would stop. You know, normally people when you watch cartoons, they don't think two things, but people would stop and watch and be like, What is this? Yeah, because no it didn't look anything. It didn't look like, like any any, other or cartoon. sound like any of the other cartoons. And uh, you know, cause w- you know, when you have high hopes as a kid and you turn on super fans, you know, oh yeah. too bad. Cause these are really good characters. You know, if they did Aquaman the way he's in the comics, you'd actually get some respect. Well, the closest they get, like I remember in the Hanna Barbera Super Friends world, was Challenge of the Super Friends, where they had them fight their equals, like you know the Legion of Doom and stuff oh, right, like that. Right, okay. And there was that was I remember in one of those episodes, I think it was in that run, they had Batman do their they did the origin oh of his parents getting killed, and I shall become a bat in that in the episode with the scarecrow. It's weird. I remember watching it. God, it's going on 15 years ago, maybe I seen it. And I was just like, how did this happen? How did this slip by everybody? Like, it's kind of the only moment in Hanna Barbera, Super Friends, Justice League, Batman history that is not like, come on, Robin. Yeah. Let's go stop the Riddler. Right. right. Like it's it, in and, broad daylight, always. Yes, always. And and the voiceover, you know, it's tough for the actor who I don't know who played the old Batman. Oh, um, Alan Soule. I, I'd have to look it up. But Tough for him. To I do kind of remember. I do remember suddenly. Ted Knight doing. Meanwhile, in the Hall of Justice, that was Ted Knight. Ted Baxter from the Mary Tyler Moore Every Show. Every one of those voiceovers is Ted Knight. Well, the narrator. The was. narrator. Yeah, and I think he voiced a couple of the heroes because in those days you do three roles. And most of my Jokers, I'm doing Joker, and I might be. A gang member security guard number two because you can get three voices where you don't get a bump so if you can uh if you do a fourth voice you get a bump so so they'll use consequently you. you don't get a fourth voice. right yeah. right right that's why we never went to 601 because we'd all get a bump uh but Warner uh, brothers very I, you know one of those things it was you one know of the, the problem with that mark is you're expecting them to wring out a little more money from a property that nobody is interested in and and is probably <laughs> probably they've lost millions on this batman concept well that's why it's so hard for me to realize that these video games i've done have crossed the billion dollar mark just think about that dude as now we don't what i love about this conversation is we can go so many places without even going into the the, the magnum opus star wars if you will but think about that you have been featured not just like in films that you know enveloped the entire world like the blob at one point right but now you're in games that probably travel even farther than those movies did. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Well, it is crazy. And the thing is, when you do a video game, you really have no idea how it's actually going to play. So until it gets into the marketplace, I remember I booked uh, uh, Wolverine. And I said, look, I don't do Hugh Jackman. I can do what I do. And I did a sort of a Clint Eastwood raspy thing. And they said, great. So we do the whole game. You know, the, the scripts are like two phone books put together. And again, cut to six months after it's out. And I give it to the boys. and say, oh, by the way, how is the Wolverine game? And they both look at each other like, well, you were good. I go, is it a horrible game? And they go, yeah, dad, it's just the worst. And they were right. I never did a sequel. 
But like I say, how do we know? Right. You know, because they have great graphics. You know, the dialogue seems right. You, you see the story arcs. It's hard doing the branching off because you can't control your performance. If they want the Joker to become enraged, they can go this way. If they want him to be benign, they can. It's, so it's really schizophrenic. Right. And you can't really arc a performance the way you would in a, a three act narrative. But uh, like I say, when the game came out, the first one, Arkham Asylum, and my kids are emailing me, go to Joker. Joystick.com. You're not going to believe it got a 9.7 out of 10. Right. Well, I was thrilled. I mean, I was so happy because Warner Brothers was complaining that they never had a Batman game that really went into the stratosphere that was really, really good. And they finally hooked up with the right people. And I was lucky enough that Rocksteady, which is the British group that was going to do it, first of all, they hired Paul Dini, smart, mm. smart, smart. Very smart. And they hired Kevin Conroy, smart, smart, smart. And Kevin and I, like I say, were you know, frick and frack, we're Laurel and Hardy, we're, he's my, you know, what's funny too, because as actors, we, I remember I was on the train with him, we were going from New York, we were going to do um, um, QVC, which is you sell products on the air. Right. We sold out everything within 20 minutes. We were booked for two hours, so we just took over and started telling anecdotes. Chit -chat. QVC, the quality villain channel. Nice. You know, and I was I had high school kids calling in, hey, Mark, I sat behind you in B9 English. Oh, yeah. And they said, you can't do that. You can't communicate like a phone call <laughs> right. on TV. Right, this is your private time. Exactly. <laughs> but there was nothing left to sell. We sold these glass in case they were beautiful i have one in my house if you ever come see it it had a storyboard and that joker that. and batman batman and joker in front and center yeah. is from the warner brothers yes, collection exactly. warner brothers store. and it had the background was all storyboards and yes. it was kind of a, a 3d effect because they were on a painted in glass, glass in front so anyway we were we went to do that and kevin and i are simpatico because we both come out of the theater and and he's not a comic book guy at all which i love about him and uh, when we were talking about uh, our respective characters, we kept going, wow, that's the same as me. You wear the bad outfit to throw fear into the villains. I use my scary, ghoul-like, scarred face to physically intimidate uh, uh, from the other end of things. Right. They're really almost like they're made for each other. And that's why I say a uh, man who killed Batman really influenced uh, I really got an insight into who he was uh, because Paul Dini showed what a empty shell he was. He had no motivation. It's like, why bother? Mm. I mean, his life was over when his reason to be was gone. They did that a couple of times. Remember the episode where Harley has Batman upside down so that the smiles on the fish yeah. and then she, and then, uh, you know, uh, Batman, like uh, Joker takes him down. He's like, I'm sorry. The kid is, out of yes. her mind, blah, blah, blah. And, he's, and he later, Batman says, he's like, that's the, she got closer than you ever came. I know. And there's that moment where he goes ape shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it really, and that's another thing, because I'd read these scripts and I'd say, how can I treat her so shabbily? <laughs> know. You know, because she's just succulent. You just want to, you know, and disappear so damn nice to into you her time. neck. Yeah, and she's, whatever you want, pudding. You know, <laughs> she's the ultimate male fantasy of a subservient, sexy woman, and he's knocking her aside. And, oh, my God. Um, she even has the like, you, you want to rev up your Harley or ride your Harley? I don't yeah. think they're going to let her say ride, but I think they let her say rev up rev your Rev up your Harley. Yeah, sometimes you'd slip by things that the standards and practices wouldn't get until it was too late and it was out in the in the world. But um, Now, wait a second. The I remember reading you going, um, I'm, I, this is my last Joker swan song in the Arkham right. City game. Then I read recently, there's a Facebook page because their DC or Warner Brothers, DC Direct, whoever does those movies, has announced that they're doing Killing Joke. Is that true? Because here's what happened. I didn't know that the other shoe dropped, because here's what happened. People said to me, because I was sort of myth that, you know, it makes a billion dollars, and in the, the old days, I could get a royalty. But in the new corporate 99 and the 1%, they won't set president. I said, you mean Al Pacino didn't get a piece of Godfather too? They said, no, they paid him what a quarter of a million dollars for two hours work, right. but they will not set precedent because it's a new rule, not an old rule. I mean, like I say, in the seventies, the new media thing. Yeah. I, I'm wing commander on star Wars. I mean, you get a little, not a lot. Mm. It's like, if you play saxophone and the, the, the album goes supernova on, I got you, babe, right. you get your 12 cent royalty check. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair is fair. That's why I'm a pro union guy. Right. 
uh, so I was really miffed because I said, we don't even get a bonus, you know? I mean, I did the sequel to Prince of Egypt. When they wrapped the one with Spielberg, they all got Lexus cars. You know, I did, <laughs> I did the sequel, but it was Ben Affleck was the only star they carried over. Instead of Ralph Fiennes and Michelle Pfeiffer, it was all the best voiceover talent, you know, all my buddies and me. Right. Uh, and Kevin Michael Richardson was in it. Uh, and they kept, it went on for a year and a half. It was direct to video. We rap and we get uh, DreamWorks baseball caps. So <laughs> I said, look, give me a part of it. And then I'll really want to go out and hit the road and promote it and go on talk shows and radio shows and all that. No, no, no. They, on the second one, they gave me, I remember the salary got high enough where my agents were going, please take this. We've never had any one of our clients get that much. And I'll tell you off air what it was. It's a joke. This is for the game? For the game. For the game. And I said, well, lightning won't strike twice. And this definitely will be my last one because you can't go on forever. You don't want to overstay your welcome where people go, I'm sick of him as the Joker. You know, I don't think anybody's even close. To well, if that. the quality is good, I mean, you start being in something that's not as good, and you overstay your welcome. That's in what this, I'm in saying. In fact, this isn't even ass kissy. But now that I do a brief kind of like do 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 across every synapse, looking for, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say anything even remotely negative about your Joker. Never saying like, oh, it's too much, or oh, it's done, or I'd like to hear a new Joker. And whenever they switch it up. The only thing you ever hear about online is like, why didn't they fucking use Mark? I know, because I, I thought, uh, what's his name? Uh, Joe, John DiMaggio did a really husky, macho Joker that I liked. I liked the dark place he was coming from. And like, it's like Hamlet. You, it's going to be reinterpreted. Many different Of course. You know, Heath Ledger is just as legitimate as Larry Storch in his own way. <laughs> uh, but, but for the record then, and if, if they are indeed doing Killing Joke... Well, here's what happened. You should. You have to do what, it. What, what I said was this, because when people were saying, I wasn't even saying definitively, this is my last Joker. It right. just was interpreted that way. Right. I was more of a mode of, well, you have to look. Uh, Especially uh, if you know the game at all, without spoiling the game. Right. It seems like the, yeah, right. the one to, without, you know, right. I said, it's you the know, one to do but that. But also on. actors look, as much as they like a good entrance, they look for a good exit. Mm. Don't, you know, know when to get off. No, let Jimmy Stewart or uh, James Cagney said, enough. I'm one, two, three. That's my last picture. And now I'm going to go and uh, enjoy the fruits of my labor. Uh, so you don't. And then my point was, uh, I, I'm still sort of miffed that I didn't get to do Mad Love as a a book to tape. I said, you know what I'd really love to do? Now, Alan Moore doesn't like Moodoo. He doesn't like V for Vendetta. He doesn't like Watchmen. He doesn't like uh, From Hell. All of his He hasn't liked any of the adaptations of his book. No, and a lot of times when you read him, he says, I don't watch them. Yeah. But he just knows he doesn't like them. Maybe he's read the script. I don't know. But I said, we might be able to get around that by doing a book on tape where we say his words word for word. He might think that has some sort of integrity because it's the original work but for the we killing just, joke. For the killing joke. Yeah. But we just do it on tape. And so how could you be more faithful? I wasn't even thinking like direct to video or anything like that. So uh, in some situation, I said, yeah, I'd do that. If they do killing joke on uh, a book to tape, I would do that. And my daughter tweeted it. And then it got out into the ether. And now, like you say, there's, there's a Facebook page. There's a petition. Let's have Mark do Killing Joke. Because that would be the ultimate swan song. That is. if you're. I mean, it's it, you talked before about like the, the, the uh, uh, Kevin Michael Richardson got an Emmy nod. You didn't get an Emmy nod, which is fucking baffling. <laughs> baffling. And I'm not, that's no slight to Kevin. It's just like, holy Christ, how does your performance over all those episodes, even if you feel it's 20% of the run, not get fucking cited, not get nominated. In a world where you didn't get that, they got to give you the fucking killing joke. That's the, that's the crown great. jewel, man, if you're going to, of the joke. Well, also, too, I lost, I lost twice at the Annie's, but I was nominated twice uh, for, I remember they said, congratulations, you got an Annie nomination. Said, what's the Annie's? It's free animation. Okay. Uh, what's it for? For the animated series. I said, who am I up against? They said, let me look. I heard the rustling of the pages. They said, um, Eddie Murphy in Shrek. I went, stop. Because <laughs> the Annie's mixed TV and movies. Right. And, you know, that's a once in a lifetime performance, you know, right. where it all worked. Eddie is at his best. He's perfect. He elevates the movie to a whole different level. So I went to the uh, ceremonies totally relaxed because I knew I wouldn't have to get up there. A couple years later, I think it was for Mask of the Phantasm. I get nominated again. Okay, who, who, who am I up against? Here are the rustling of the pages. 
Uh, let me see. Jeremy Irons for Lion King. Stop! <laughs> Stop right there. Stop. Uh, again, so that was two Annie's lost. Then I went to the VGAs and I got beat by Jack Black. What was he the voice in? It's something where he played <coughs> Jack Black. <laughs> You were like, so the, I gave a performance. Well, the thing he is, was himself. What I loved he about won. Batman originally is if you don't read those ridiculously fast credits, you don't know who played the Joker, and no one would say, oh, that's Mark Hamill. Right. It's so far away from what you know me for. That I mean, to me, one of the things I love about animation is a character actor dreams of being able to dissolve themselves into the character where you no longer see the actor, you only see the character, like Lon Chaney Sr. or Charles Lawton in Hunchback of Notre Dame. By definition, that's what voiceover is. You can't see the person. Mm. So you can't, you, if everything works right. That's why when kids come up and say, do the voice, do the voice, or people trying to I mean, do the voice on camera, I said, it's like a magic trick. It's going to ruin the illusion mm. if you see my face and, and you don't do it as a whole with the character and the animation and all of it. Um, so that being said, some of my favorite moments of the last few hours have been watching you dip into the Joker and watching you <laughs> physically perform it. He doesn't, it's not like, uh, he just sits there and suddenly this voice comes out of him it, for no, that you, moment. He, he yeah, changes you his whole get, body becomes exactly. It. You got to get into it. And I do. And one thing that's great about animation is I don't think I'd ever dare to extend myself quite as much as I do if I could be seen Right. because you don't have any fear of, uh, appearance anxiety. How's my face? How's you my perform hair? Perform without a net. Yeah, it's like doing a telling your story, like telling your daughter a story in the dark, where she's imagining everything, mm -hmm. and the only thing that exists is your voice. Now, I know it's not radio. I mean, I, I romanticize. Uh, mythologized the golden age of radio because I would have loved to have been a part of it. But when we would do these Batmans, it was like we were back in the 30s doing, meanwhile, in an abandoned factory. Right. You know, It seemed that way. And even though we knew the animation would come later and the music and so forth, it was really like a radio play where the person that was, uh, would, was directing would read the stage direction. Batman enters the warehouse and suddenly is enveloped by you know a bolero... Uh, uh, trap, you know, and then you read the dialogue. It had a sense of continuity. It had a sense of a group endeavor, like reading a play reading. Because mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, or not nowadays, but certain studios, Disney's really big on micromanaging, so they'll do you by yourself. I asked Jonathan Taylor Thomas, so did you have fun in Lion King working with James Earl Jones? Oh, I never met him. Oh, really? No, he played his father. Right. Those great emotional scenes together. And I know what it's like. Because, and Disney's not consistent. They don't always do that. But they like they would put it as we're able to concentrate mm. just on that one performance without having to keep track of everybody's schedules. Now, when I've directed animation, you, you color code wh what actor's playing what part. And there's certain tricks you learn. The hardest thing I found was trying to get people out in time. Tress gives me 90 minutes. She's got to go do Futurama. Right. So let's do her and the security guard and the this, this. I mean, all the things that you expected, I'm sure you've discovered this with directing. You imagine what the problem is going to be when you actually get on set. It's completely different than what you imagine. It's not the issue. Of like, course. That's the, you that's never the would have, molehill. Right. You never would mountain. have dreamed that that would be the deal, mm -hmm. the size of the shoe or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, um, it, it, as we went along and we knew it was coming to an end, I thought, boy, I'm going to miss these people. And that's why every inter incarnation that you didn't expect, whether it was like I bumped into Paul Dini at Golden Apple one time and it was long after Batman had wrapped and they were doing Batman Beyond. And my wife was kidding me because with uh, George's movies, they go back in time to before Luke was born. Right. Then I did Wing Commander and then they did the movie and they made my character 20 years younger when he was in flight school right. and it was Freddie Prinze played my character. Right. And now Batman Beyond is going... Jumping in the future. Years. She goes, can't you pick one franchise <laughs> that will go in the right direction that will help us? <laughs> and keep you going. Exactly. So I saw Paul in the comic book store and... I said, hey, Paul, come on. Why don't you bring the Joker back on uh, Batman Beyond? I could be a head in the jar like on Futurama. Hey. And he said, well, be careful what you wish for. I said, what? What? And he goes, I can't really tell you now, but people will contact you soon. I go, what? What? No, wait, no, what? 
And like he, 10 days later. Uh, he, I'm sorry, man. It's just kind of like, it, what an amazing moment that must be for Paul Dini that like, you you basically you dipped into like I want to go to Tashi Station to pick up power. <laughs> <converters>. <laughs> I'm getting a whiny baby on his ass. Yes. I want to be back doing shows. <laughs> tell me, tell me what Please. it is. Please, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, he said, well, no, they had come to him and said, will you do a direct to DVD of uh, Batman Beyond? And his th- thought was, I will if I can bring back Joker, because just like I have an affinity for his scripts, he has affinity for the character. And by by extension, I'm sure he's you know I'm, I should read his inscription in my book. But uh, he uh, he found a way to do it. And like I say, this was like found money in your couch cushion. Right. It's like picking up a pair of trousers and finding a ten dollar bill in the pocket. You go, oh boy, I, or a snow day right. when you wake up and there's no school. Oh my gosh, it's a thrill that was unexpected. So that happened on. Uh, Phantasm, it happened on Son of the Joker, or I keep saying Son of the Joker, uh, Return of the Joker, and it happened on the in these video games. Because I said to him, when I saw the video game Art Direction, I said, this is nothing like anything I've ever done before. Now, our art evolved over the years, but this looks like some horror gothic yeah. novel. It was 3D, and everybody's so nasty looking, except for the women. And they're right off the cover of Maxim Magazine. Right. It's like they start with a nude body with erect nipples and then put clothing on over <laughs> One layer it. of clothes. Oh my God. I've never seen renditions of any of the, from Harley to uh, Poison Ivy to Catwoman. It's just the sexiest renditions because they're going for the boys that read Playboy. Yeah. So uh, it's a different demographic. But uh, I said, are you sure you really think I'll fit in this world? Because when I when people say what what makes your Batman different than other Batmans, I said, well, you know, you in live action you can never really accomplish. This is blurred now. With the Avengers, you can pretty much do anything you can draw on the page. But what I'm saying is, when you actualize in three dimensions the costumes or the, I discovered it doing Trickster. I mean, what an in convenient outfit when you 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 can't see out of the mask as a you domino got, mask you got a cap the cape that gets caught in the fan i almost did an isadora duncan just walk into lunch one day <laughs> it's so impractical i had those genie shoes with the curly q i was supposed to jump out of a jury or out of the testimony box when parley bear was the judge mm. and strangle my attorney now i love that i mean what chance in <laughs> acting do you have to flip when you're on the stand leap out of the box and get your hands around the neck, a lawyer's and neck. it was a woman. <laughs> oh, good lord! <laughs> so I was ready to go, and it was just a rehearsal. Later, when I got back from the hospital, they said you didn't have to go that far. I just went to the infirmary because when I leaped out of the box, I caught the your curly shoe, Q, curly Q shoe, on the edge of the box and landed face first on the deck of whatever soundstage we were on. Now I, it could have been really terrible, but. I didn't break anything, but, uh, you know, people were just astonished that I was so willing to throw myself into it because I thought I'm only going to be able to do it twice or three times. It's right. television. They got to move on. And, and I'm going to been reading comics for enough years, watching comics related media where it's just like a leap from the box in the outfit is going to be big theatrical. You're, you're oh. a panel from a comic book comes yes. to life. I have a trickster mobile. Yes. Are you kidding that me? That was amazing. I remember watching those episodes because I like the flesh show, but like your kids, there was that always that feeling of, yeah, you know, he's just beating up normal dudes yeah. who are wearing normal clothes. He so didn't have they, the tread, the cosmic treadmill where he could go in the past or the future. They would have eventually. If, yeah. they, if it had it run was for, great. Look, no complaints. Yeah. It was really if strong it, material. If, if it had run for five years, they would have found themselves because they, Danny tells me now, I'm still friends with. Uh, uh, and they're the guys that did The Rocketeer. Yeah. yeah. Bilson and DeMeo. They wrote the script. Yeah. And I, I you know, I'm still friends with them. And uh, uh, they said, we really crossed a threshold because when we gave in to the fact that we should have uh, adversaries that were larger than life. Mm. Our fear was becoming the 60s Batman. Right. But that's all in, under your control. They, but they said- if you don't camp it up. Right, exactly. Good. And it was un, until they actually did it, did they, they said all these lights went off in our head. Then immediately they did Mirror Master. They did Ca- Captain Boomerang. They were really going on. They were really hoping. They kept moving them around. Mm. It's on Saturdays. Now it's on Thursdays. Now it's at eight. Now it's at nine. Now, oh, it's ridiculous. You couldn't find it if you were a fan. So it's no surprise that uh, they, remember they... the Remember the cover of TV Guide put that image of John Wesley Ship in yeah. the Flash outfit next to an image of Michael Keaton in the Batman outfit. Oh, yeah. And it was, I remember just 
really geeking out hardcore because you're like, oh my god, oh, Batman and Flash are on together. The same cover. This could work. Yeah, like, yeah we're yeah. so close to yeah. a Justice John League movie. John was a blast to work with. I'll tell you, the second uh, the second trickster I did where I, I hypnotized him, mm -hmm. so he was one of my minions. Right. Uh, ain't he bullets that kill things. It's these little hard things. Yeah, yeah. He just he was really, very playful. Yeah, he let go, and he was. I know it was fun for him because he was so stoic when he was, you know, supposed to be the real character, and then when he was under my. Yeah, we did that thing from Clockwork Orange where I the you know, eyes where you made him watch all these hypnotic images and so forth. They said Joel Schumacher watched that episode over and over and over and over again before he did his first Batman. And there's so many images: me in the in the padded cell, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The straight jacket, and Paul and Danny did a list where. And it, let's be fair. I mean, there's only so many things you can do. But they, you know, they said there's no question. We're not saying he ripped us off, but he certainly was influenced by our. Our, our trickster episodes and uh, uh i, I, know, I that, don't know if you want to take credit for that well <laughs> i wanted to i wanted to get i thought i'd gotten it all out of my system because by doing the trickster it was like going back in a time machine and being frank gorshin on on, on the riddler yeah exactly uh, on batman there's the riddler so i thought i really got that out of my system i always wanted to be a bond villain i always wanted to be and i i do like villains because they're much more colorful i mean the reason ba uh, joker never gets boring for me is that because he's insane he's unpredictable right mm -hmm. You know, you don't know whether he's going to kiss you or slit your throat. And he could probably do both in a, in a heartbeat. I love that. I told you the eulogy I did where he goes from really calm till, you know, he gets, he remembers how angry he is at this little pile of Weasley dog spit. I, we had to get around. We couldn't say, right. you know, it's when the spit hits the fan. It's like West Side Story. You can't really make him sound like real gang members. <laughs> but they found the euphemisms for me to speak and I won't be happy until that man there gets put in that box there and pushed into that vat of acid there. And he puts it in. I wish I had a camera. Harley plays Amazing Grace on the kazoo. Right. <laughs> She's weeping all through my eulogy. And Matt Frewer as uh, uh, the, uh, Sid, the, Sid the Squid, goes down into the acid. And once it's all over, the, the Joker does the 180 degree switch from that peak of madness to... Well, that was fun. Who wants... Who's for Chinese? Yes. <laughs> you know, you know, I just said, oh... I, I, and I wrote that in that introduction. I said, actors live a lifetime to get a speech that rich, mm. a character that colorful that, like I say, it's almost like he, I let him take over me, you know, based on what's written on the page. But it's like, I don't know what I'm going to plan. But once I get into his shoes and in my head, I see myself, I am six foot two, because I'm not only too short for a stormtrooper, I'm too short for... <laughs> for joker it takes you to a different place and it it, 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 it it there's colors in there that i would never feel as mark ever right you know because i mean i know i'm not a sadist i don't have that schadenfreude there's a couple of guys where i go i hope he doesn't have another and he's got too much success but i'm not <laughs> it's not like joker. it's not like yeah bitter and kind of like, oh ah. yeah where he just gets off in a way i mean he's almost gets the wrong kind of pleasure out of other people's misery. And what he finds funny is so twisted and weird. Right. And how uh, part of Batman he is and how, even if you don't go that far where you say, oh, well, he's sexually attracted. If, if you just realize that you complete me. Right is really, you know, and Kevin and I on the train going back and forth, because he went to Juilliard, you know, he went, I went to City College, $8 and a pen and you're in. <laughs> I didn't go to a name, right. you know, like Carnegie Mellon or any of those. Big acting school. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I just got such a great kick out of the, the fact that, number one, he's one of the nicest people in any walk of life that I've met. He's just a nice person. And uh, he completely you know when he read the batman i don't think he'd ever even seen the movies it's so weird he just it's not on his radar right. scope he just doesn't care what is this now batman yeah okay. right yeah he doesn't mind that i love it right but he's never read a batman comic uh so he got a kick out of me being the uber fan and uh uh but i was really interested because as we were talking about our characters we, we were both on this mutual self-discovery of wow we are more alike than we thought because you know we, we both have an ego um 
you know, and we're just like the yin yang, you know, like Batman would like to go about his business and make put order into the world with no nonsense. He's so serious all the time. And I can't do anything unless it's a performance right. art. You know, that's one thing about uh, my performances. I would say that I did do Commedia dell'arte at the Renaissance Fair. So I come out of understanding what the Harlequin was originally meant to be. So I say with the Joker, how could he not be hugely theatrical? You know, I mean, larger than life. So, I mean, like I say, they went in the opposite direction with Nolan and, right. and Ledger. But I said, there's a certain pretentious quality, you know, that he just thinks of himself. He Nobody loves him more than him. He is a... Uh, a- a dinner theater actor who thinks he's worthy of an Academy Award. He's Rupert Pupkin. There, there you go. So much Rupert so. Rupert Pupkin went nuts. And yeah, <laughs> he's nuts. furious that these peons don't understand and his genius. Yes. They're not worthy of understanding the kind of uh, brilliant man he is. In that way, I think there's a little bit of the Joker in all of us. We yeah. all have that moment sure. sooner or later where we're like, they just don't get it. Don't they see? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm the Joker in front of the Joker. That was no, bad. that's great. And listen, I love people. I mean, people say, uh, they come up to me and I've heard people do me better than me. Do, you, I mean, do people, it's got, thank God for the Joker because that's an impression you could do. Does anybody ever try to do Luke Skywalker? You know, I don't know. I jokingly, when I was directing comic book, the movie, I used almost all voiceover people because that's who I knew. Right. We didn't even have the budget to have proper casting sessions. I'd go to people and say, will you play a studio executive take one afternoon? And everybody was jumping on board because I built up such a, 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 a long relationship. Network and, of friends. Yeah, and they all, once they know that you're not slumming and, and you're really committed wherever you go, whether it's Broadway, they were suspicious of me on Broadway, and they went, wow, he doesn't miss performances. He's, you know, he's not complaining. He doesn't have a chauffeur or a, a minder, you know, a right. personal assistant. Uh, so you, you, I love being accepted in all these different communities. But um, also, too, one of the reasons I went to Broadway is I got to play character parts. You know, mm. the Elephant Man, Mozart, uh, the sleazy producer. And when they, the critics came to see me in room service, they thought I was the Midwestern playwright. The, that golly, the guy, you know, right. the Marx Brothers did a version of it. But uh, there's a Midwestern playwright who's really naive. He's just the country bumpkin. And when, I, when they came, I had the slick back hair, the pencil line mustache, I like a half a uh, jar of uh, uh, dippity do in my hair, the pants up to here. I got a review from Frank Rich saying, like all great Jewish comedians, Hamill is willing to share the stage. And I went, wow. He thinks I'm a Jew. Right, and in, that's how good you were. That, well, in uh, in New York, yeah. you know, to play, a, you know, because when I met Mel Brooks, he just said, look at this guy, he's up on him. And, you know, yeah. you know, does, <laughs> yeah. He couldn't believe how Gentile look. You know, you're relentlessly Gentile. There's nothing Semitic about Luke Skywalker. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> he's so, Midwest as yeah, it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, and people don't get that I got that. You know, they all think that's who I am. You know, but, but you know, it's, it's one of those things. Performance. Clearly performance. So, uh but, but, you know, who would have dreamt that all these years later you'd get one of the best character parts in the world in a cartoon? Yeah. And so uh, if you've come full circle, one, when they say, how do you see your Batman as opposed to all the others? Ours is old school comic book. It's, it's the closest so. thing to a moving comic book because the stories are compact. And there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. They use his detective skills. All of the things that you missed in the TV shows – and the movies, um, and to a certain extent, like I say, they've done a great job with uh, every incarnation has its attributes. But uh, in terms of uh, you know what what was fun about reading the comic books coming to the screen, this is was a, a, a great great experience for me. And you crushed it, sir. You crushed it for a long, long time. Consistency, like when you look at the movies, uh, you know, and this is not to take away from anybody's performance, but you get to do it once. And that's it. You do it over the course of a couple months, maybe two months, and then you're done. Yeah. And you never have to do it again. And yeah. they put a lot of money behind it, a lot of score, a lot of bigness, and people go, wow, it's much tougher to get up and do it again. And then again, mm -hmm. and then again, and then, and not irritate people yeah. and not have people get tired. You crushed it. You, you, we had great writers. You had great writers, but uh, don't take away from that performance. We heard it here in the podcast. When you you've come to life... <laughs> When you played a Joker. So I'm going to end with a geeky question. Go ahead. Um, Darth Vader versus Batman. 
Who wins? I'd have to say Batman. Why? Well, okay, he, he's got his, he's as sharp as Vader in intelligence. Mm. And I think he physically can overtake Vader. Now, Vader has magic. He can. It's the force. The power of the mind. So um, it is a close call, but I, I would assume Batman would have a way to make sure that he. It's like, you know, those. We just watched Brides of Dracula last night. Okay. And said, Don't look him in the eyes. You know, it says Peter Cushing, you know, and instead the girl looks right in his eyes and she's right. immediately mesmerized, you know. <laughs> so you would hope that Batman would have nothing as. Uh, Egregious as bat shark repellent right. from the movie, but you know something. Where bat he, midi chloridians, yeah, or, or he like have that. like earplugs or something so that he could fight that uh, mystical power. But you put me on the spot because I never really thought about it. And I'll probably it's have... something I've been thinking about so much lately, <laughs> so I much probably... so that recently I, I had we did a contest online where I was just like, all you web animators, uh, show me what it would look like, Batman versus Vader. Oh, that's funny, and they did, and we actually wound up pulling some cool animators for the YouTube channel. We got C Smod to do animations yeah, yeah. based on the podcast, but there were that we saw. I, I guess maybe eight to ten, but three that we picked were were some were funny, some were some. One of them was uh, um, guess who's coming to Gotham, <laughs> and so you see Batman and Vader in a headshot, and they're just like, "I'm gonna stop you, Vader. I'm gonna do it." Yeah. And then Vader's like, "I, I, I yeah, will yeah, stop yeah, you, yeah. Dark Knight." And then finally they pull out, and you see them playing the board game. Guess who? <laughs> so Vader is just like, yeah. "Is your character?" I, I, or, uh, Batman's like, "Is your character a redhead or something like that?" <laughs> and Vader's using the mind trick. So it it was. It's been on my mind lately. It's a well, we keep you question. know I, as we were saying this, I realized I've started uh, uh, stories where we get sidetracked. Uh, and you were talking about, does anybody imitate you? And I was going to say that when we were doing uh, comic book, the movie, I had all these voiceover people in oh, one beautiful. room. You're closing. You, you're so good. You are meant to podcast. And so I said, you to have them, to keep doing this. I said, this. you know, I'm lucky. I'm like Robert Redford because I don't have a, a specific distinguishable voice. Nobody can imitate me. Right. That's true. And then, well, I thought so, but then I saw, Kevin Michael and Jeff Ben, all these voiceover people shifting their eyes back and forth, like going, What, what, what? He does you, and Rob does you. They all have Kevin a Mark Hamill. You. Yes. And I said, Let me see. And then, No, no, no. I said, Why? Is it that bad? I mean, is that, that embarrassing? And I, I found out later that it's, it's more of an attitude. It's more of the, um, um, is, is Joker wet by this? I mean, I ask a lot of questions. Right. Especially if so their I, impression isn't so much based on your actual voice. Voice, it's, it's the it's the attitude and the right. presentation, and they they say that more of a satirization. Yes, right. exactly. And they take whatever you have and they exaggerate it. And they said it's hysterically funny if you can get them to do it for you because uh, I don't distinguish between a Edward Albee play and an episode of Pinky in the Brain. Right. You go. I'm a human tomato. So am I like a salad tomato or <laughs> a cherry tomato. I need to know for my, you know, uh, what's that line in Tootsie, you know, a where he's just like, I was a juicy, sexy, a beefsteak tomato. I did a whole endive salad that knocked the critics on their asses. <laughs> a tomato would never say that. He's complaining about the script. A tomato sure. doesn't have logic. <laughs> That's what I said, George. So if he doesn't have logic, how can he move? Yeah. You, uh, I, I want to thank you of course, for being such an epic part of my childhood. But then in my adulthood as well. Yeah. Joker lasted, honestly, Joker lasted longer with me in Star Wars. Dude. Yeah. Like that, and, and still reigns to this day. Still. And we had fun on Jay and Silent Bob. With so, that as well, yeah. a little taste of it. And, and our that wives was, get along. That's not no small thing. No, that's Sometimes true. Sometimes you have to true. end friendships because, because of the that. wife doesn't like the, yeah, yeah. I know that. I you know. are amazing, amazing uh, talent, sir. You crush it as the Joker, man. Uh, I thank you for doing this. You were. When we put up the first episode of Fat Man on Batman, immediately it was just a sea oh, of bet. tweets of, you got to get Mark, you got to get Mark, you well, got to get Mark. Well, I hope they influence people and we get to do Killing Joe because that would be a great swan song. It needs to happen. Who the fuck else? Who possibly know. could they well, go after? Well, you know, they said in a way you sort of did your origin in, uh, in uh, 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 Mask of the Phantasm. But I said, yeah, but in terms of epic 
really fan venerated uh, material. It's an Alan Moore script for yeah. heaven's sakes. Every comic book geek worth their salt would. Like How do you to. think the the young before Watchmen's are going to do? They asked me if I wanted to do one of those, which was real. I was flattered by it. But did you know what character time, they asked you to do? No, they didn't specify. And naturally, of course, if you I was into Rorschach. it, I, everyone would have went for Rorschach. But I immediately, I was just like, I, I said, I'm flattered, but no, life's too short. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I'll have to like eat shit for what the rest of my life. What cartoon did the Watchmen Babies? Oh, awesome. What was, was the, that? It was in the Simpsons, Simpsons episode. They were on the cover of a video. <laughs> Watchmen Babies, V for vacation. Oh, that was hilarious. I hope Alan Moore at least saw that because uh, uh, I, 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 I'm convinced he has a sense of humor. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, the biggest heartbreaker for me is when... Uh, uh, Terry Gilliam was proposing a 12 two hour movies miniseries on HBO to do Watchmen. I said, it's the only yeah, way. That was the And move. I said, it'll become an event like The Sopranos. I mm -hmm. referenced whatever it was because I said, instead of just doing a movie where you, it's impossible. Something larger than life. Yeah. So I was really had my fingers crossed because I didn't mind what was on the screen. Watchmen, but I pitied the person who I went with who had never read the books, who had no clue as to what was going on. Yeah, this, I thought Snyder did a really nice job. It felt like a fantastic cover song, but if you don't know the original, yeah, you know it's the you're right. Yeah, and to he me, used the heart of it was when they went to the golden age. It was so poignant, and I thought if they really had the time to really stretch out. So you didn't get to that till movie number three or four. Mm -hmm. If it had been on HBO, that was the closest. I was really, really hoping that would happen because that was back when I, I was I was buying multiple copies of that to try and give to people who had never read comic books before. Cause I'm sorry, we have to stop and appreciate uh -huh. the moment where uh, Luke Skywalker, the Joker, is geeking out over the Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Hamill, ladies and gentlemen.